chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Donnie sat in his beat to shit pinto with the heater on full, huddling for warmth beneath the driver's side window that wouldn't quite shut. An icy wind whipped through the half-inch gap, numbing his hand as he checked his 38 special. He shoved the piece in his coat pocket and then stared across the street at the Minimar, the neon quick-stop sign flashing red and blue in the night. It was the only store on the downtown strip still open this late. All the other stores had their shutters lowered, tagged with graffiti like tribal markings. Through the window, he saw the scrawny Arab storekeeper perched behind the counter reading the magazine. Donnie hadn't seen any customers since he pulled up outside. The guy was alone in there, just him and the cash register. Checking his reflection in the rear view, Donnie gave a pained sigh. He looked and felt like stepped on shit, sick with whatever bug was going around. Last thing he needed was to be pulling a job, but he was already late on this week's vig. He didn't pay what he owed, and the flu would be the least of his problems. He reached across the car to pop open the glove compartment, fished out his lucky ski mask. Black wool trimmed with red around the eyes and mouth. Dusting off the mask, he yanked it down over his head and then rolled it back up in a beanie hat. Donnie honked his nose in a snot rag, stuffed a hanky in his pocket with the piece, pumped himself up with a few wheezy breaths, and then he clambered from the pinto and started crossing the street to the quick stop. The bell above the door tinkled as he entered. The cramped little store was divided into three narrow aisles, the shelves stockpiled like a doomsday prepper's bunker. Loud ethnic music was playing, trumpets and drums and off-key warbling like a cat being castrated. The storekeeper glanced up from his magazine, leathery olive skin and a gray goatee beard, his bald pate polished to a gleaming shine. He wore a white collarless shirt and a ratty old cardigan. The guy reminded Donnie of the limey actor who went blackface to play Gandhi. On the counter beside him, a no checks, no credit sign was taped to the back of the register. Donnie cut a glance at the security camera above the cigarette rack. The very latest model, from the 90s. If the damn thing even worked, the playback would be a blizzard of static. It was probably just for show to scare off amateurs. Not taking any chances, Donnie bowed his head and shielded his mug from the camera's gaze as he sloped to the beer cooler opposite the counter. At the front of the store was a discount DVD bin and a half-price arsenal of fireworks for New Year's. The boxes all stacked in a pyramid like one giant rocket. Donnie glanced down the three aisles for customers or other employees. He didn't see anyone just a lonely-looking mop and bucket in aisle two. The storekeeper was clearly no neat freak. The shelves were dusty, the goods caked in grime. The place could have used a good errand. It reeked worse than Donnie's flea-pit apartment, and that was smelling something. At the back of the store was the liquor display, a few ragged cobwebs clinging to the bottles, and a steel door marked Staff Only. Donnie couldn't hear anything behind the door, but it was hard to tell over the blaring music. Maybe the storekeeper lived back there with his wife and their little kids. The hell with it. He'd be gone before anyone even knew it. With his back to the storekeeper, Donnie tugged his lucky ski mask down over his face and then reeled towards the counter, whipping the 38 from his pocket. Okay, asshole! He shouted above the music. You know what this is! The storekeeper glanced up from his magazine as if Donnie had only asked him to price check an item. Seeing the revolver in Donnie's fist, the man's dark eyes narrowed. He rose slowly from his stool, raising his hands. Unlike Donnie's, they were steady as a rock. The guy looked so calm, Donnie wondered if he even spoke English. 
Then he said with a heavy accent, Oh, yes, my friend. I know what this is. Just open the register and give me the money. You won't get hurt. The storekeeper gave a curt nod, well versed in armed robbery etiquette. Lower in one hand, he reached slowly towards the cash register and pressed the button. And suddenly he wasn't there. What? Donnie blinked in surprise. Huh? The fucking guy just disappeared. Peering over the counter, Donnie saw a trap door. The door still swinging where the storekeeper had dropped down into the basement onto a mattress. Splayed out on his back, the man glared up at Donnie with a hateful grin. Then he slashed a finger across his throat before rolling off the mattress and out of sight. The fuck? Donnie muttered. And then steel shutters crashed down over the front door and window. The power went out, the store went black, and the music and even the hum of the refrigerator shut off. Contuming the place in sudden silence. It took a moment for Donnie's eyes to adjust to the gloom. He rolled his ski mask back up into a beanie, stood gaping at the shutters in disbelief. He had never seen shutters inside a store before. He banged his fist against the shutters, thick steel like the treads of a tank. Donnie lashed out with his boot until his knee buckled, and he hobbled back in pain. Feeling his skin crawl, he glanced up at the winking red light of the security camera above the cigarette rack, shuddering as he pictured the storekeeper silently watching him. He scurried behind the counter, ignoring the register, the cash now forgotten. Careful not to fall through the open trap, Donnie searched beneath the counter for a button or something to raise the shutters. What the hell had the storekeeper pressed to drop the trap door? Donnie couldn't even find a panic button. And now that he thought of it, why wasn't any alarm sounding? Crouching warily above the open trap, he peered down into the dingy basement. All he could see was the mattress where the storekeeper had landed. Uh, hey! Donnie shouted down, panic in his voice. Uh, open these fucking shutters! He could hear the storekeeper cursing in Arabic, like a camel clearing phlegm from its throat. The guy sounded pissed like this wasn't the first time his store had been held up, but by Allah, it would be the last. Then came the unmistakable shick-shuck of a pump shotgun being racked. Donnie darted back from the open trap. That's why there wasn't any alarm. The guy planned to take care of business himself. Donnie looked despairingly at his 38. He never worked with a loaded gun. If the threat of being shot wasn't enough, then the job wasn't worth it. Better to walk away, find some other place to stick up. Ideally, with an owner who had enough sense to do what they were told when you stuck a gun in their face. Until now, he thought he was being smart. Shoving the useless fucking gun back into his coat, Donnie scuttled down the aisles toward the staff-only door at the back of the store. If it was locked, he was screwed. He'd have to take his licks and beg the storekeeper not to kill him. He was almost at the door when he heard the jangle of keys on the other side. Oh, shit. Donnie dove into aisle one and crouched low behind the shelves, cloaking himself in the shadows as the door clattered open. The storekeeper emerged from the back room, clutching a shotgun bigger than he was. He paused to yank the door shut behind him, locking it from a key hoop clipped to his belt. There was something funny looking about him. In the gloom, it was hard to tell exactly what. Then the storekeeper turned his head, and Donnie thought he'd lost his mind. A giant frog was sweeping the shotgun left to right across the aisles. Donnie tried to blink away the nightmare. Then he realized the storekeeper was wearing some kind of mask. No, not a mask. Night vision goggles. The lenses protruding from his head like bulbous amphibian eyes. Tiny jewels of sweat glittered on the Arab's scalp. He began to sidestep slowly along the end of the aisles, his cheap leather shoes squeaking as he crabbed along. The shotgun steady in his hands as he moved methodically towards aisle one, towards Donnie, crouching in the shadows. Panicking, Donnie snatched a jar of coffee from the shelf in front of him and then lobbed it over the aisles like a grenade. 
glass shattered as it exploded on the far side of the store. The storekeeper pivoted with the squeal of his squeaky shoes. <laughs> the shotgun roared, the blast punching a hole through the aisles and scattering stock, the deafening noise drowning out Donnie's scream. This guy wasn't fucking around. He wasn't going to rough him up or make a citizen's arrest. Donnie wasn't talking his way out of this shit. There'd been no hesitation as the storekeeper turned and fired. That blast was intended to cut him in half. The man meant to kill him. This should have been a quick dollar stick up. Donnie wasn't going to play cat and mouse with a shotgun toting maniac. Let the cops deal with this crazy bastard. He'd take the arrest if it meant he left the quick stop alive. He dug in his coat for his cell phone. Shit. No signal bars on the display. He waved the phone about frantically searching for a signal. Come on. Had the shutters caused some kind of blackout? He raised the phone towards the ceiling. Come on. A single signal bar flickered weakly. <laughs> he listened out for the storekeeper. On the far side of the store, he heard Arabic cursing as the man found the shattered coffee jar and realized he had been duped. The storekeeper racked a shotgun and started back along the aisles, his shoes squeaking urgently. Donnie monkeyed up the shelves in front of him. The flimsy wooden shelving board sagged beneath his weight. His ears were still ringing from the shotgun blast. He could only hope that the storekeeper had also been deafened that the guy didn't hear him as Donnie slid on the top of the shelving unit, disturbing a thick layer of dust that swirled around him in a cloud that prickled his fluey nose. The storekeeper sprang into the aisle directly below him. When he saw the aisle was empty, the Arab muttered a curse, lowering the shotgun and then adjusted the sweaty strap of his night goggles. He was breathing hard, maybe even excited, enjoying the thrill of the hunt. He started stalking down the aisle towards the front of the store. Flattened on top of the shelving unit, Donnie didn't dare move, holding his breath and fighting an almost overwhelming urge to sneeze. From the corner of his eye, he watched as the storekeeper crept along the aisle below him. The man left his line of sight, but Donnie was still able to track him by his squeaky shoe. He checked his cell phone again and gave a silent prayer of thanks when he saw there were now two signal bars on the display. But before he could dial 911, he inhaled another thick cloud of dust that set his nose ablaze. <laughs> the Arab turned and fired without hesitation, the shotgun belching fire. Donnie sprang from the shelving unit, shredded cereal boxes exploding behind him, a shower of Kellogg's raining over the store. Slamming into the next shelving unit, he crashed down into aisle two, landing heavily on his back next to the mop bucket, his cell phone shattering on the floor beside him. The storekeeper racked his shotgun and charged up the aisle towards him. Wolfing for breath, Donnie could only flail his legs, kicking over the mop bucket. Sludgy gray water spewed across the floor. The storekeeper slid on the muck like an Arabic Chevy chase. He thudded to the floor and fired another deafening blast. Plaster raining down from the ceiling. Before the man could recover, Donnie scrambled to the nearest shelving unit. He slithered across the bottom shelf, clawing through a crinkling wall of potato chip bags. Emerging into aisle three. Bracing himself against the deep freeze refrigerator chest, he hauled himself up onto rubbery legs, sucking for breath. Through the gaps in the shelves, he could see the storekeeper in the center aisle, wobbling to his feet like a prizefighter trying to beat the ref's count. Racking the shotgun with a grunt, the Arab began limping around the aisle after Donnie, careful not to slip on the sludge slick floor, one hand clutching at the shelves for balance. Donnie was still slumped against the deep freeze, trying to catch his breath. The small of his back was screaming with pain where he had landed on it. Before the storekeeper rounded the aisles and spotted him, Donnie hauled up the lid of the deep freeze. Hardly thinking about what he was doing, he slid inside the chest and buried himself among the frozen food packages. 
As he cowered inside the icy coffin, peering up in terror through the frosted glass, listening to the storekeeper's shoes squeak closer, it occurred to Donnie that as far as dumb fucking ideas went, this was right up there alongside robbing the store with an unloaded gun. The storekeeper paused next to the deep freeze. Wheezing for breath, he steadied himself against the refrigerator chest. Donnie stifled a scream as a hand thudded down on the glass lid. For a moment, it seemed like the man was staring right down at him. Then he dragged his hand from the glass to wipe the sweat off his forehead. Frowning, the Arab glanced back down the aisle, maybe fearing his prey had circled behind him. Then he moved on to the back of the store. Donnie waited until he heard the distant jangle of keys as the storekeeper checked whether the staff-only door was locked. Then he palmed up the glass door of the deep freeze and eased himself out, crouching down beside the refrigerator and listening intently. It sounded like the guy was doing another lap of the store. This time, Donnie would be waiting for the crazy fuck. He scuttled to the liquor display at the back of the store. Forced to squint in the gloom, Donnie scanned the shelves for fire water, saw a picture of Speedy Gonzalez on a dusty label, and grabbed a bottle of Arriba 100 proof tequila. Nodding to himself, he crouched behind the aisle two end shelf and then peeked around the corner, waiting for the storekeeper to appear at the front of the store. He unscrewed the bottle cap, wincing at the screech of twisted metal, but the storekeeper didn't seem to hear. Donnie listened to the guy's shoe squeaking as he continued his patrol of the store. Donnie necked a big swig from the bottle, for what he needed to do, and for courage. He shuddered as the tequila burned through him. Snatching his snot rag from his pocket, he began stuffing it into the bottleneck until only a little cloth tongue poked out. Then he pulled his Zippo lighter from his pocket and thumbed the wheel. The storekeeper's shoes stopped in mid-squeak. The Zippo shook in Donnie's hand as he torched the snot rag fuse. The shotgun roared. A tower of Heinz cans exploded on the shelf above Donnie's head. Spaghetti sauce sprayed down over him, nearly snuffing out the flame. The storekeeper reloaded, feeding shells into the shotgun like a degenerate gambler playing the slots. Donnie mopped the spaghetti sauce from his eyes and then leapt out from cover. They faced each other like Old West gunfighters. A tin of beans rolled like tumbleweed across the aisle between them. The storekeeper saw the Molotov cocktail in Donnie's hands. His mouth dropped open in shock. He started raising the shotgun. Donnie hell married the burning bottle and then he watched in horror as it sailed harmlessly over the storekeeper's head. The bottle shattered against the steel shutters behind him and burst into flames. The storekeeper stood silhouetted before a wall of fire like a frog-headed demon from hell. Oblivious to the danger behind him, the storekeeper sneered at Donnie as he aimed a shotgun, his finger teasing the trigger as flames started licking the fireworks display. There was a blinding white flash, and then the fireworks boomed like Hiroshima. Instantly, the storekeeper became a human fireball, the blast blowing him off his feet and hurling him up the aisles like a missile. He sailed straight past Donnie and crashed into the staff-only door thudding to the floor like a piece of barbecue you tossed to the dog. The front of the store was now an inferno. Rockets ignited and screeched from the flames, setting shelves ablaze, the sound deafening inside the steel shuttered store. The place was fast becoming a death trap. Donnie crouched beside the charged storekeeper. He took off his coat and smothered the flames of the man's burning cardigan. Wrestling the key hoop from his belt, Donnie juggled the red-hot keys, yelping as they scorched his palms. Wrapping his coat around his hand like an oven glove, he unlocked the staff-only door to reveal another locked door marked Delivery, and stairs leading down to the basement. 
Donnie knelt in front of the second door and sorted through the jumble of keys, trying to find the key that would fit the lock. Something squeaked behind him. Glancing over his shoulder, he saw the storekeeper staggering to his feet. His face was flame-grilled hamburger. The night goggles were melted onto his head like devil horns. He propped himself up in the doorway, smoke coiling from the scorched rags of his cardigan. Before Donnie could stand, the Arab lunged at him, slamming the shotgun across his throat, pinning him against the door. The fire had fused the shotgun to his hands. The melted flesh of his fingers was webbed across the stock as he crushed Donnie's larynx. Choking, Donnie grappled the shotgun and shoved the guy back. They stumbled across the landing, tumbling down the stone steps and thudding onto the concrete floor of the basement. Landing on top of Donnie, the storekeeper jammed the shotgun back across his throat and pressed down with all his weight. Donnie spluttered and bucked, the key hoop in his hand jangling wildly as he flailed at the man's face before he slammed a long mortise key through the left lens of the Arab's night goggles, driving it deep into the eye socket. He then wrenched the key in the man's eyeball like he was forcing open a rusty lock. The storekeeper gave a hog-like squeal. His head jerked back, the keys dangling from his face like bloody jewelry. Yolky yellow gunk gushed from the shattered lens of his goggles, spraying across Donnie's face. Gagging, Donnie hammered the heel of his hand against the key, burying it deeper in the Arab's eye. The storekeeper shrieked, lurching to his feet and staggering blindly about the basement. Donnie scrabbled back across the floor, spitting eyeball fluid and heaving for breath. The Arab crashed against the stock shelf, cans and jars clattering and smashing on the floor around him. He reached up to remove the keys from his eye before realizing he couldn't, not with the shotgun welded to his hands. His arms twitched pathetically, once, twice. Then all the fight seemed to drain right out of him. His body sagged, and he slumped down on a camp bed parked against the cinder block wall, the spring squealing like his squeaky shoes. Huddled on the bed, the man glowered at Donnie with his one good eye, the other a ruined hollow of red and yellow slime. He slowly raised his left knee. Donnie watched in disbelief as the man planted the left sole of his shoe against the length of the shotgun and sucked a few shallow breaths before he flexed his leg and the melted flesh of his palms ripped free from the stock with a sound like Velcro tearing. The shotgun clattered to the floor in front of him, but he was too weak to reach for it. With raw and bloody hands, the Arab grasped the hoop of keys dangling from his face. Donnie covered his mouth with his hand, nearly begged the guy to stop, but he couldn't look away. The Arab yanked on the key hoop. The key ripped from his eye socket with a wet popping sound. He gave a yelp and fainted dead away flopping back on the camp bed with the keys clutched tightly in his fist. Donnie almost fainted himself. His head was spinning as he staggered to his feet. He peeled off the ski mask and covered his nose and mouth to keep from choking on the thick black smoke belching down into the basement through the open trap door above them. Fiery ash rained down onto the mattress. It wouldn't be long before the fire spread downstairs. Already, the basement was baking like a pizza oven. He took a wary step towards the storekeeper, eyeing the keys clutched in the man's fist. It looked like the guy was out for the count. All it took was getting burned half to death, blasted into a wall, thrown down a staircase, and stabbed in the eye. But Donnie wasn't about to take any chances. This guy was like the fucking Terminator. He kicked the shotgun beyond the Arab's reach. It skidded across the floor and clanged against the legs of a workbench. Donnie paused when he noticed some kind of photo shrine on the wall above the workbench. The cluster of photos showed a young woman. The storekeeper's wife, Donnie figured. She was beautiful. Even in a burning building, Donnie could appreciate a piece of ass. And very pregnant. Beneath the shrine sat a chunky security monitor but it wasn't showing the store go up in flames. 
Instead, it was hooked to an old VCR player running a short loop of silent film. The grainy black and white footage was time-coded in the bottom corner, dated six years ago. It showed the storekeeper's pregnant wife as she stood in terror behind the shop counter. She was opening the cash register for a jittery punk wearing a stocking mask that smashed his features. He was clutching a pistol in a sideways gangster grip. The cash drawer slid open. The punk's pistol spat fire. The back of the woman's long hair flailed as her brain splattered the cigarette rack. Bloody cartons of smokes rained from the rack in a waterfall. The woman crumpled to the floor. Leaning over the counter, the punk raided the cash register, pocketing bills as he fled the store. The footage looped and played again, and again. Donnie looked at the cushioned chair parked in front of the monitor. The cushion cratered by the weight of the husband and the weight of the grief pressing down on him. How long had the storekeeper sat here? Hour after hour, day after day, watching again and again as his pregnant wife was gunned down by a two-bit stick-up man, a piece of shit like Donnie. Before the footage could loop and play again, Donnie switched off the monitor. He saw his reflection in the blank TV screen and was about to look away in shame, sickened at the sight of himself. Then something in the screen's reflection caught his eye, a sudden movement behind him. He wheeled around in time to see the storekeeper swinging a fire extinguisher by the hose like a mason chain. The metal butt of the fire extinguisher scythed across his jaw, smashing teeth and bone, and Donnie dropped like he had been shot, like the storekeeper's wife, out cold before he hit the deck. When he came to, Donnie found himself face down on the cracked concrete floor. His ankles and wrists were bound tightly with duct tape, hogtied behind him. He raised his throbbing head weakly off the floor. A rope of congealed blood drilled from his mouth, puddling like black treacle on the concrete. His vision blurred in and out of focus, but he could see that he was still in the basement. The room was fogged with smoke that was starting to clear. The fire upstairs had been extinguished. The storekeeper must have doused the flames while Donnie was unconscious. Donnie listened intently for the wail of EMS sirens outside. Surely someone must have reported World War III breaking out in the quick stop. But all he could hear was the sound of someone digging. A section of the basement's concrete floor had been broken, probably by the sledgehammer propped against the wall. A slab of stone levered up to reveal the dirt below. The storekeeper was using a shovel to dig a hole in the plot of earth, piling up the dirt beside the steel drum with a skull and crossbones symbol and a label marked Lie. The Arab's wounded hands were swathed in bandages. He grimaced in pain as he worked the shovel. Whenever the pain seemed too much to bear, he would glance at the security monitor on the workbench watching the footage of his dying wife again and summoning the strength to continue digging. When he was done, he climbed from the hole and loomed over Donnie. Donnie tried to beg, but his shattered jaw and blood-clogged mouth allowed only a pitiful choked whimper. The air had planted a foot on him, his shoe giving the last squeak Donnie would ever hear as he kicked him into the grave. Donnie landed on his back his bound arms and legs twisted painfully beneath him with the impact. He watched in helpless terror as the shopkeeper began shoveling the dirt over him. The last thing he saw was what looked like another shrine on the wall directly above him. No photos this time. Donnie thought this one looked less like a shrine than a trophy wall. Nailed to the cinder blocks was a stocking mask a bandana, and three ski masks, one of them black wool with red trim around the eyes and mouth. And not so lucky, after all.
And that was Clean Up on Aisle 3 by author Adam Howe. A good reminder that the most dangerous man there is, is the man with nothing to lose. And you never do know who you're dealing with. Just something to consider when you're robbing your local convenience store. So, for our second segment tonight, we've got some shameless self-promotion. Just released on Amazon and Audible.com is Adam's latest audiobook, Tijuana Donkey Showdown, and it's a banger. And Adam, if you're listening to this, I'm not calling your book a sausage. In America, that just means it's good. Sausage is good too, but, well, I'm sure you understand. So, without further delay, I give you Chapter 1 of Tijuana Donkey Showdown. Chapter 1 For a great Buick, call 555-7617. I first met Harry Muffet in the men's room at the hen house, Walt Wiley's Titty Tonk in Bigelow Town, where some fella looked like an orc from the Lord of the Rings movie, only not as pretty, was using Harry's head as a toilet plunger. The York had Harry by the ankles, dunking him head first into the crapper like he was dipping a donut in his morning cup of joe. He dragged Harry's head from the bowl and granted him a gulp of air to prolong his misery. The York clearly hadn't done him the courtesy of flushing the commode. Harry's face was freckled with the previous occupant's leavings, maybe the York's, in which case this was a premeditated deal. Filth was spewing up over the rim of the bowl, spreading across the cracked tile floor of the men's room. I shook my head and sighed, not needing three guesses to know who'd be cleaning up the mess. This was already shaping up to be a regular rare morning. The men's room door clattered shut behind me. The York's head cranked around, and he glared at me. A tree stump of a man with a patchy red beard, like even his facial fuzz wanted off his ugly mug. He wore a sweat-stained shirt with a trucking company logo on the back, and his name was stitched across the breast, maybe so he wouldn't forget it. That name was Otis. Well, of course it was. In my experience, you can't reason with an Otis. They are ornery as hell. I stayed standing where I was at the entrance to the John, my new copy of Ring magazine tucked under my arm and last night's microwave burrito, which had seemed like a swell idea at the time, bolting through my bowels like a fugitive fleeing for the border. I fidgeted from foot to foot. You fellas gonna be long? Because the men's room at the hen house had just one commode, not counting the sink, although on rowdy weekends a lot of fellas did count it. Harry came up for air and spluttered. <laughs> the hell you think's going on here? I wouldn't want to jump to conclusions. And do I look like a willing participant in this? On consideration, I had to admit he didn't. And you work here, right? I glanced down at the black t-shirt I was wearing. Staff was printed across the chest, except most of the A had rubbed off in the wash, so it looked more like it read stiff. My boss, Walt Wiley, for my sins he was also my best friend, thought that was hysterical and refused to spring for a new shirt. I looked back at Harry and nodded reluctantly. So do something! Otis glanced between Harry and me. This piece is shit a friend of yours? Harry started telling them how we were lifelong buddies, willing to die for each other. Unable to hear over Harry's yammering, Otis shoved his head back down into the toilet bowl. Harry's gargling cries echoed through the men's room. Nope, I said to Otis. But I am the head bouncer here. I couldn't resist using the trumped-up job title Walt had given me instead of a raise. Except Otis called me on it. There's other bouncers in this dive? The point is, I said, I can't allow you to drown the man in our commode. Not least because I was likely to contaminate the crime scene when I took a dump in it directly afterwards. Otis's face crumpled in disappointment, like he couldn't believe what this country was coming to that a man was no longer free to drown someone in a strip club toilet. Thanks, Obama. Well, you don't understand, mister. This horn-swoggling son of a bitch sold my sister a death trap on wheels. He damn near killed her. Harry came up for air and protested. I can't be held responsible once the car leaves the lot. 
She wasn't 50 yards off the lot when the brakes failed, Otis said. She nearly went under a truck. Well, <laughs> Harry said with a sheepish chuckle. Shit happens. Which was an unfortunate choice of words because down he went again. The next time Otis led Harry up for air, I canted my head like an art critic and took a closer look at him. And I suddenly recognized his face, soiled though it was, from the advertising billboards around town. The sign said, Harry's pre-owned American Auto. Buying a new pre-owned? You'll be happy as Larry you bought from Harry. In the billboards, Harry was holding up a set of car keys, grinning like a fisherman with the catch of the day. Behind him was a fleet of gleaming luxury cars that looked nothing like the decrepit beaters I saw on display whenever I passed his dealership. He was wearing the used car salesman's uniform of a check sports jacket and slacks with the stars and stripes tie. He boasted a magnificent bouffant of hair and a mustache like Tom Selleck's in Magnum. If Magnum lost his private eye license due to conduct unbecoming and went to hell in a bourbon bottle, Given the ubiquity of the billboards around town and the late-night TV commercials that aired on local cable, Harry Muffet was something like a celebrity in Bigelow. I made the mistake of saying, Hey, I know you. Harry clutched at my words like a drowning man clinging to flotsam. That's right, Reggie. You do. Of course you do. Help me, please. I wasn't overly surprised that Harry knew my name. I was something of a local celebrity myself. Even Otis narrowed his eyes, sized me up and down. Reggie Levine? Once upon a time, I was a prize fighter. I could have been a contender. Until the day I fought Boar Hog Brennan for the light heavyweight state title. And he damn near beat me to death. Years later, when it was of scant consolation, I discovered he'd cheated in our match. But that's another story. More recently, and memorably, my claim to fame was what most folks in town called the skunk ape thing. A couple of years ago, a creature believed to be the mythical Bigelow skunk ape, a backwoods Bigfoot with B.O., abducted our high school football mascot, Boogaloo Baboon, plus the man inside the monkey suit, Ned Pratt. I found myself among the posse who set off into the sticks on a rescue mission along with Eliza Tuttle, who used to dance topless at the hen house, and who now acts often topless in Hollywood B pictures. Eliza's boyfriend, the late Lester Swash, and self-proclaimed skunk ape hunter Jameson T. Salisbury. Now, it turned out the skunk ape wasn't no skunk ape. It was just a big-ass orangutan called Mofo. Unfortunately for us, Mofo was bad-tempered, and Randy as a goat with two peckers, Poor Ned bore the brunt of his lust. To make matters worse, Mofo was also a member of the damn Dirty Apes Motorcycle Club. The apes were cooking crystal meth out at Herb Planter's old hog farm and were not best pleased when we stumbled across their operation. Needless to say, things went foobar right quick. Eliza, Ned, and me were lucky to escape with our lives. Salisbury and Lester weren't so fortunate. Probably that sounds a little strange to you. Well, no shit. I was there, and I still struggle to believe it really happened. Maybe you saw the Hollywood movie they made? Damn Dirty Apes. Swept the board at the Razzies last year. Eliza debuted as herself in the movie and did a pretty fair job of it. Me? I've got a mug that'd break a radio. Nicolas Cage played yours truly, sporting a mullet that made his con air do seem conservative, even though I haven't styled my hair like that since the 90s. But who in the hell am I to argue with the artistic choices of Nicolas Cage? The man's an icon. Ever since the movie was released, people had started visiting the hen house to hear me tell the story in person, or to ask me questions about Nicolas Cage, who I never met. So they'd always leave grumbling and disappointed. Stranger still were the folks who'd started bringing me their problems to solve, like I was some kind of one-man A-team who could help them. But worst of all were the scalp hunters, the badasses who wanted to test their mettle by dancing a few rounds with the skunk ape slayer, Reggie Levine. It looked like Otis was the latest of these knuckleheads, just bigger and uglier than usual. He stomped from the toilet stall like a troll from his cave. He was still clutching Harry by the ankle, one-handed no less, 
a show of brute strength that hardly filled me with joy at the prospect of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. I heard of you, Otis sneered. Mr. So-called Skunk Ape Slayer. With a grunt, he flung Harry clear the length of the men's room. Harry crashed against the condom dispenser and thudded to the floor. A rain of rubbers ejaculated from the machine. Novelty rubbers, I should add, because for most of the patrons at the hen house, getting laid was indeed a novelty. We're selling fantasy here, Walt liked to say. Otis marched towards me, chinking his neck and bawling ham hock fists. I'd like to see you beat on me like you beat on that orangutan, he said. Did I mention that those damn dirty apes made me box mofo the orangutan? True story. I don't want no trouble here, I said. All I want is a crap. Otis loosened my bowels with a left hook to the gut, and I filled my shorts with liquidized burrito. I managed to wheeze. God damn it. Then he grabbed the front of my shirt and hoisted me up into the air. The top of my skull cracked the ceiling light with a crunch of plastic. The light bulb started spazzing, turning the men's room into the world's seediest discotheque. Still clutching my copy of Ring magazine, I swatted Otis over the head with it, like I was trying to housebreak a puppy. That didn't do much else except piss him off, so I jabbed him in the eye with the rolled up end. Now he was really mad. He let out a roar and pitched me across the room like he was trying to beat the record he had set hurling Harry. I crashed through the flimsy wooden wall of the toilet stall, reducing years of historic graffiti to kenneling. On hands and knees inside the buckled stall, I clutched a crapper and tried to steady myself. But before I could clamber to my feet, Otis landed on my back like Hulk Hogan leaping down from the turnbuckle. The breath woofed from my lungs. Otis gripped me by the hair and started shoving my head down towards the shit-choked toilet bowl. Snatching the porcelain lid from the toilet top, I swung the slab back over my shoulder and smashed a heavy tablet in two across Otis's forehead. Otis let out a grunt. His hands relaxed on the back of my neck. Squirming free from his grip, I scrambled across the stall away from him, wedging myself between the commode and the wall, like someone seeking shelter during an earthquake. Otis was out on his feet, teetering ominously. His eyeballs rolled up wide in his skull. Blood streamed from the gash in his forehead where I'd brained him with the cistern slab. He dropped to one knee like he was about to propose. Then, instead of popping the question, he toppled forwards, his bulk crashing down on the toilet bowl and shattering the porcelain to rubble. A tsunami of sewage flooded across the floor, drenching me in a stinking spray of brown and yellow filth. But, thank God, at least Otis was done for. I glanced across the men's room expecting to see Harry cowering beneath the condom dispenser, grateful for me having saved his life. But he was gone. The sneaky son of a bitch must have vamoosed while I was tussling with Otis. I leaned against the wall and caught my breath, not to mention a ferocious whiff of ripe human waste. Otis was splayed face down in a lake of piss. I didn't have the heart to just leave him to drown, so I rolled him onto his back. Okay, so I kicked him onto his back. Hard. He deserved that much. Surveying the flooded floor, I spotted a leather wallet propped up against a turd. It must have fallen from Harry's pocket while Otis was shaking him upside down. The wallet, I mean, not the turd. I fetched the wallet from the floor and tossed it in the sink and ran the faucet to clean it some. I'd return it to its owner with a few choice words. My new ring magazine was beyond salvage, reduced to mulch, and that really pissed me off, because I had had to order it special from the store in town and there was no telling how long I'd be waiting for a replacement. I grabbed Otis by his ankles and started yoking him from the men's room. 2. The hen house was much as I'd left it when I went to take a crap. In fact, the place had hardly changed in the couple years since the skunk ape thing. Same slab of oak bar fringed with old Christmas lights. Same shrine of dusty liquor bottles behind it. Same butcher block tables and chairs. Same shadowy booths and slashed vinyl seats. Same old Lou, 
huddled in the end of the runway stage like a seedy off-Broadway theater director, tithing the dancing gals from his pile of palm-clammy singles. Same old Marlene, the hen house's sumo-sized dancing queen, working the stage in her G-string and pasties, spinning her tassels like Chinook rotor blades. Same cigarette-scarred pool table. Same Smokey and the Bandit pinball machine. I'd lost my high score to another pinball wizard, but was determined to claw it back, no matter how many quarters it cost me. The old rotary phone in the telephone kiosk had been repaired, but cell phones had been invented during the time it was out of service. Walt Wiley, the owner of the hen house, was holding court behind the bar. Mark my words, he proclaimed. When the cops catch this backseat strangler son of a bitch, he'll be a Mexican. The usual barflies were lining the oak slab like crows along a telephone wire, hanging on Walt's every word in the forlorn hope of a free shot. On the wall behind the bar was the framed yellowing news cutting commemorating my fight with Boarhog Brennan. Bigelow boy brutalized in prize fight. Walt had since added more news cuttings about the skunk ape thing, for the tourists he claimed plus the postcards we'd occasionally receive from Eliza out in Hollywood. There was even a framed poster from the Damn Dirty Apes movie. It was signed in a shaky hand, to my good friend Walt, Nick. Walt had, of course, signed the poster himself, which was why Nick Cage had misspelled his name and then sworn me to secrecy. Other than that, yep, same old hen house, all right, and same old Reggie Levine, neck deep in shit, only literally this time. 3. I ankle-dragged Otis from the men's room, smearing sewage across the floor in our wake as I lugged them to the door. Walt took one look at me and he must have remembered the funniest joke he had ever heard, because he started slapping the bar slab and laughing his ass off. Toilet humor, he said. Can't beat it. <laughs> he said to the bar flies, Take a picture on your phone, would you, someone? Great, I thought. A new addition to my wall of shame. Go take a look at the men's room, I said to Walt. Let's see how you like toilet humor then. I dragged Otis outside, left him in the parking lot to wake up and hobble home. He could count himself lucky I didn't call our local lawman, Constable Randy Ray Gooch. Although, frankly, the fewer people saw me looking like this, the better. I went back inside, dripping on the wipe-your-feet welcome mat. Walt was still snickering. You see a used car salesman go running past? I asked him. Covered in shit? Guilty look on his face for leaving me to get killed? Walt considered for a moment. Uh, apart from the guilty look, you must mean Harry Muffet. Walt, I said, I'm gonna need to take a personal day. You asking or telling me? You really want me working, looking, and smelling like this? I could tell he was tempted to keep me around, if only to bust my chops. But in the end, the stench won out. See you bright and early tomorrow, champ. Before I could leave, he called out, Reggie, wait. I turned back around and was blinded by a camera flash. When my vision returned, Walt was grinning at the photo he had taken on a camera phone. Oh, yeah, he said. That's a keeper. I fetched a sheet of tarp from the bed of my truck, spread it across the seats like a dog blanket, and then I drove home to change with the windows wide open and my head hanging out like Rover on a road trip. With the money I got for the movie rights to my story, not as much as you might think, I put a deposit on a nice little house in a goodish part of town. Figured I'd been living in my crummy apartment above the thrift store long enough. I also treated myself to the new second-hand Ford, thankfully from one of Harry Muffet's competitors, so it still ran. The rest of the money I'd given to Walt to invest on my behalf, if only to stop him nagging me. Walt fancied himself as Bigelow's answer to Donald Trump, and politically speaking, he wasn't far wrong. Walt had talked a great game about how he was going to turn my little nest egg into a fortune, but it turned out that's all it was. Talk. He promptly lost a lot to a Nigerian fishing scam. So, thanks to Walt, I lost all my movie money and forfeited the deposit I'd put on the house. A nice young couple lives there now. They've just had their first child, a little boy. 
Sometimes I'll drive past the place, not in a creepy way, I hope, and wonder what might have been. Long story short, I was still living in the same old flop house above the thrift store. I parked in the spot outside the thrift store that the owner, Mrs. Gorin, reserved for me. Mrs. Gorin was a kind-hearted bird whose innate need to mother matched my own to be mothered. We got along swell. She had put aside for me the men's adventure novels people donated to the store, as well as any hand-me-down dud she thought might flatter me more than my regular white trash chic wardrobe. All she asked in return was I occasionally help out in the store with any heavy lifting, which these days was as close to a workout as I got. For some time now, Mrs. Gorin had been threatening to set me up with her niece from Ayersville, which was a dubious proposition. See, I'd already met her nephew, and not to be unkind, but if his sister looked like him, the gal was likely to be less in oil painting than Neanderthal cave art. Now, you could make a solid argument that I had no right being picky. I've got a mug you wouldn't wish on a warthog. But the truth of the matter was that my heart belonged to another. She didn't want it, of course, and sometimes I'd wonder if Cupid's aim was off, considering how unobtainable the objects of my affections were. But it was hers all the same. Shelby Boone was the new town veterinarian. She had taken over the practice from Edgar Dubrow after the Bigelow Bugle exposed Dubrow's involvement in a neo-Nazi dogfighting racket, and he was struck off the veterinary register. Shelby had the kind of big brown eyes Van Morrison must have been singing about, a tomboyish crop of raven black hair, and cute little dimples in her cheeks and chin. Nor had it escaped my attention that there was one humdinger of a body beneath the practical shirt and pants she wore. Coming from a guy who works in the strip club, there's no higher compliment, as I told her when we first met. It would be an understatement to say Shelby was unimpressed by that comment, or the rumors I had killed not just an orangutan, but also a bear cub. As I climbed from the truck, caked in human filth and reeking of ditto, with the sheet of shitty tarpaulin glued to the seat of my pants like an errant scrap of toilet paper, Shelby emerged from the thrift store, where she'd been checking up on Mrs. Gorin's cat, Bootsy, after his recent operation. Shelby saw me and stopped in her tracks. I froze, hoping maybe if I didn't move she wouldn't see me, like a T-Rex. Then the wind changed direction. She made a kind of gagging noise, and I knew the game was up. I raked my hand through my hair in a futile effort to make myself look presentable. Morning, Doc. Powdered excrement flaked like brown dandruff from my crap-caked locks. Shelby shuddered in disgust. Inside the store, I caught Mrs. Gorin shaking her head in despair. I guessed I'd probably blown it with her niece now, too. Long story, I said to Shelby. I don't want to hear it, she said, backing away from me. Gotcha. Feeling like I'd been kicked in the heart. I squelched past her to the outside stairs leading up to my flop house. 5. You're expecting the Ritz, right? Sorry to disappoint you. Unless you envisioned the Ritz cracker box, in which case, yeah, the place was about that size. It was a combination living-slash-bedroom-slash-kitchen kind of deal, with an ensuite bathroom. Kind of one big room, really, only not so big. But I made it my own and decorated the place with empty takeout cartons and crushed beer cans and pack ratted piles of pulp books and ring magazine back issues. A withered brown cactus plant clung to life on the windowsill. Above the unmade sofa bed was the poster from Rocky you'll find on the wall of every boxer's crib. I fetched a brewski from the icebox, glugging it down as I showered the shit off me but I couldn't sluice away Shelby's look of disgust. Face it, Levine, you're just a broke-down strip club palooka, living in a shoebox above a thrift store. A classy broad like Shelby Boone would never look twice at a pug like you. Hell, you'd be lucky to land a date with Lorena Bobbitt. The shame of it was that I'd actually had a second chance to get my shit together and make something of myself. Sure, after the skunk ape thing and the money from the movie, I'd made a half-assed attempt to better myself. I'd put that deposit on the house, 
Even made some inquiries about opening my own boxing gym, thinking maybe I could help disadvantaged kids, which in Bigelow was most every kid in town. Help them stay out of trouble by beating hell out of each other. But it was all just a pipe dream. No different than Walt kidding himself, at my expense, that he was a Wall Street whiz. In the end, I'd been content just to sit on my ass at the hen house pissing away my fifteen minutes of fame until all I was left with were the familiar regrets and self-loathing. I couldn't shake the feeling that by giving Walt my money to invest, I'd subconsciously sabotage myself. What the hell was wrong with me? Did I just fear change? I showered for about an hour, avoided my reflection in the medicine cabinet mirror as I cinched a towel around my spare tire, fetched another cold one from the icebox. Then I went and slumped on the sofa bed, gazing up at that poster of Rocky and Adrian. Was it really too much to ask? Hearing faint ticking, I glanced at my watch on the upturned orange crate that served as my side table. The watch had been a gift from Nicolas Cage, thanking me for my contribution to the Damn Dirty Apes movie, and for being a good sport about how the movie had turned out. It had a snakeskin strap like the jacket Cage had worn in an earlier, more prestigious movie. The jacket that symbolized his individuality and his belief in personal freedom. Rules to live by. The face had a picture of the Bigelow skunk ape that gave me the willies whenever I checked the time. The beast's long arms formed the watch's hour and minute hands. Not to seem ungrateful, because the watch was pretty sweet made sweeter by the fact that it had come from Nicolas Cage. But after everything I'd been through, sometimes I felt I deserved more than just a watch, ticking to remind me time was slipping away. Luckily, I hadn't worn the watch to work that morning. It was waterproof, but I doubted that extended to piss and shit proof. I checked the time and saw it was business hours. Harry Muffet's car dealership would still be open. Was I still mad enough with Muffet to pay him a visit? You're goddamn right I was. 6. Harry's pre-owned American Auto was located in the hazy gray area between the bad and worse sides of town. One look at Harry's fleet of cars and you could see why more people were buying foreign these days. The place was little more than an automobile graveyard. The chain-link security fence was probably to prevent folks from junking their own clunkers here. If that happened, I figured Harry would have just slapped a sales sticker on the piece of shit. Draped above the lot like patriotic cobwebs were ropes of red, white, and blue plastic pennants, snapping tackily in the breeze. The mess of ropes was connected to an ancient Airstream trailer that looked like a big rusty toaster. Moored to the trailer was a twenty-foot-tall balloon man. The balloon man's likeness to Harry was unmistakable. He wore a checkered sports coat and slacks, even sported Harry's trademark mustache and shit-eating grin. The giant balloon man was filled with helium. I knew this because every month or so, he'd mysteriously break free of his bonds and float above town like the Goodyear blimp. For Harry, it was great free advertising. I trucked down the wide central lane, bracketed by banks of used cars and stopped outside the airstream. The inflatable Harry loomed above me, grinning and swaying in the breeze, the mooring ropes creaking as he strained against his bonds like a chained King Kong. A bird had shit on the balloon giant's head and smeared Harry's grinning face with guano. Maybe another unsatisfied customer. The sign on the trailer door said office. The trailer was pitching and rocking like the coin-operated spaceship outside the laundromat in town, where the mamas parked their rugrats while they did laundry. Squeals and smutty laughter echoed from the trailer as it rock and rolled. Blue balls were the least I owed, Muffet. I hammered on the door. The trailer abruptly stopped rocking and swayed to a standstill. I heard whispered voices in a frantic scramble for clothes. Then the trailer door swung open, and Harry appeared. He was beat red, panting for breath, tucking his shirt tails into his slacks. Artfully zipping his fly with his wedding ring hand, he raked his other hand through the sweaty corkscrews of his hair, and then gave his fringe a Bobby Kennedy flick. 
In the office behind him, I saw a pretty young woman I guessed was Harry's secretary. She was hastily rearranging her desk clutter and straightening her blouse, which she was wearing inside out with the label poking up like cow-licked hair. Apparently, I had knocked while Harry was in mid-sentence. And be sure to bring me those papers to sign the moment they arrive, Miss Clemens. It might have been a more convincing performance, if not for the bitchin' heat stink baking from the trailer. Miss Clemens' brassiere draped over her desk and Muffet, angling his hips to hide his heart on. He saw who I was and panic flashed across his face. Then he plastered a grin across his mug. Reggie! You made it! Like I was a long-lost war buddy. No thanks to you, I said, and tossed his wallet at him. It bounced off his shirt and left a stain. Seems like I hadn't cleaned all the muck off it after all. I almost smiled. You left this behind when you ran out on me. Harry was crestfallen. Ran out on you? He said in disbelief. Is, is that how it looked? That's how it was. He chuckled at how I'd got this all ass backwards. Reggie, he said. As God is my witness, nothing could be further from the truth. He took a moment to invent the truth. I had to race back to the office was all. Poor Miss Clemens here was holding the fort by her lonesome. I only stepped out for a quick bite to eat. A beer and a lap dance must have been Muffet's idea of a power lunch. When that ruffian attacked me. Without provocation, I might add. Then it's not true what Otis said about his sister? He dismissed my pedantry with a wave of his hand. Let's not dwell on that. He leaned towards me and whispered. Is he dead? You mean Otis? Of course he's not dead. Harry looked disappointed. You think I'd just up and kill a man? I'm a bouncer, not a stone-cold killer. The way I hear it, you have before. Killed, I mean. That was different. That was self-defense. Even the orangutan? Especially the orangutan. Just then, a plump gray rat darted from the trailer, claws clicking on the asphalt as it scuttled towards me. It clamped itself to my ankle and started humping my foot furiously, like the world was about to end and it wanted to go out fucking. With a cry of disgust, I started shaking my leg like Chuck Berry doing the duck walk, but I couldn't dislodge the critter. Then I realized it wasn't a rat. No, that would be an insult to rats. It was a dog. The ugliest fucking dog I'd ever seen in my life. A Chinese crested terrier. I'm more of an American bulldog man myself. Or a cat, if my only other canine option is a Chinese crested terrier. The beast's hairless body was a sickly plucked pink, spackled with markings like liver spots. The straggly gray fur of its mane, tail, and booties had been groomed like a My Little Pony from Hell. It pumped away at my foot, emitting high-pitched yipping noises with each thrust. Its eyes narrowed to lusty slits. A stub of pink tongue poked between snaggly yellow fangs. I could feel a damp patch developing on my ankle. Harry chuckled, a little too indulgently for my liking. <laughs> Quit that, Gizmo! <laughs> He clawed the little beast from my foot and tucked it under his arm. The dog started angrily yipping at me as if I was a tease playing hard to get. Cute dog, I lied, frowning at the semen stain on my shoe. Gizmo? Like the movie, Harry said. You know, don't feed him after midnight. Looks like someone already has. He glanced at the ugly little monster squirming under his arm. What can I say? It's my wife's dog. Sometimes I think she loves this damn mutt more than me. Hard to believe. Actually, it was pretty easy. The dog's yipping was giving me a headache. Listen, Muffet. Hey, call me Harry. Muffet, I said. I just came to return your wallet. A regular Boy Scout. Not really. You'll find it's light. I reimbursed myself the cost of a new shirt and pants. The soiled shorts were gratis, but he didn't need to know that. Plus a copy of Ring Magazine. I grinned. That okay with you, Muffet? He peeked inside his empty wallet and winced. Hell, it's the least I could do. He almost sounded magnanimous, as if he had coughed up the dough himself. 
I said, and you can bet your ass Walt will be in touch with the bill for the damages. He paled. Damages? About a men's room worth, I said, and then I doffed the brim of an imaginary hat. Fuck you very much, Mr. Muffet. You have yourself a shitty day. I started back to my truck. Uh, Reggie, wait! I stopped, sighed, and slowly turned around. I feel terrible about what happened, he said. Just plain terrible. Yeah, well, I'm sure Miss Clemens will lend you a shoulder to cry on. He chuckled sheepishly and quickly changed tack. You know, I followed your boxing career. Is that a fact? Oh, sure. The Bear Hug Brannigan fight. Boar Hog Brannan. Hell of a fight, he said without skipping a beat. I figured the extent of his knowledge about my boxing career came from the news cutting on the wall of the hen house. You know I lost that one, right? Well, sure. It was a close fight. Not really, unless you count when he broke his hand on my head. Uh, all the same, I, I could use a man like you. For what? Protecting you against disgruntled customers? No, no, nothing like that. What happened with Otis was an aberration. I strongly doubted that, but against my better judgment, I said, what exactly did you have in mind? Going down? The woman in the elevator said this with a goofy smile on her face. Given that we were on the hotel's top floor, there really wasn't anywhere else to go but down. The smile was contagious, and I found myself coughing to hide that. Yep, ground floor. I stepped into the elevator and noted that the ground floor button was already glowing. Going out for dinner too? Bachelorette weekend. The woman explained. I got sunburned on the beach today, so I spent the afternoon sleeping in the suite. Everyone else headed there without me, so I'm a bit late. Ever been to that Mexican buffet down the road? That's where we're meeting up for dinner. First day here. It's all right, as long as they put out fresh lettuce. I pushed the closed doors button, only for the woman to shoot her hand out to stop the door from closing. She'd spotted the elderly gentleman I'd completely and inadvertently missed seeing approaching the elevator. Thank you, dear, he said in a low baritone, tipping his head at her. Second floor, grandkids wanted to the pool. With the nice beach right outside? The woman joked but she punched the first floor button all the same. <laughs> There's not an all-you-can-eat ice cream machine outside the beach. The old man chuckled. The doors slid shut without any more interruptions, but we'd just gone down a single floor when the elevator paused and its door slid open with a ding. The pair of teenagers outside non-stop giggled as they darted into the elevator. Go, go, go! The girl squealed as she repeatedly punched the closed doors button. The doors slid shut and the pair high-fived each other, pleased with the stunt they'd pulled. I cleared my throat. <clears throat> in a hurry? I asked. They finally seemed to notice the three adults in there with them. The boy puffed his chest out a bit, while the girl giggled as she explained. My parents wanted us to watch my little brother tonight while they went out. We're beating them to it. Ah, teenage mischief. I shook my head but chose not to judge further. Just kids being kids. The elevator dinged again, and the teenagers looked panicked for a brief moment, only to relax when the doors opened and revealed the other side did not contain angry parents. Only a man on his cell phone. He didn't attempt to hang up when he entered the elevator, talking, far too loudly in my opinion, on his cell phone about some business or other. The elevator wasn't packed to the brim, but it was certainly full now, so when the doors closed and we began our descent for the third time, I thought that would be that. The elevator came to a jerking halt, sending me tripping forward and right into the back of the man on the phone. Do you mind? He snapped, even though he'd tripped as well and had to use the wall as support. I grumbled an apology as I stood back up straight, waiting for the doors to open. They didn't. The teenage girl made a disgusted sound. Hey! She slapped the frozen doors. Open up, come on! Obviously, the impassive silver doors didn't respond, although there was now a handprint left behind on one of them. 
I glanced up at the floor numbers, only to see they had gone dark. I think we're stuck. The man on the phone sputtered angrily before he stuffed his phone back into his pocket. Great! And I just lost signal, too. I'm gonna demand a free night if this bucket doesn't get moving. He snapped. The sunburned woman raised a hand. Settle down. Give it a minute. The last time I came down this elevator, it had a hiccup too. I spoke to the front desk about it. They're getting someone out there this week to fix it. Oh, God, how long were you stuck here? I have to meet my family for dinner. The man snapped. The woman chose not to continue engaging in this conversation, but the elderly gentleman frowned. Why didn't you go with your family? He asked. The man scoffed. I don't expect you to understand, but I work for a living. I had to finish my call with my business partner. Told the wife to get the kids out of my hair so I could finish in peace, he said. The elderly gentleman raised his eyebrows. Family vacation without family? Sounds like a lonely time, he said. The man scowled, but just returned to his phone, trying to dial out. I looked up to see everyone else reaching the same conclusion. I fished my phone out of my pocket, just in case we needed to call out for help, but I had no signal either. No signal. Seconds ticked into a minute, then two, three, four minutes. This is insane! When I get out of here, I am going to sue this entire hotel franchise for this inconvenience. The man with the phone exploded with no warning. He shoved the teenage boy aside and tried prying open the doors with no success. The woman shook her head. Have fun trying to win that suit for just a malfunction. It's not like we're getting dropped to our deaths, she said. Aren't you pissed off too? He asked. Of course I am. I'm supposed to be drowning in tequila by now. But acting like a child who was told they couldn't have another slice of cake will not get this elevator going any faster. Before a fight could break out, I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> um, I'm Christopher. Immediately, all eyes were on me, and I felt more than a little out of my league. I'm a computer engineer, just wanted to enjoy some time off. The woman immediately picked up what I was trying to do. I'm Whitney, she said, a brilliant white smile crossing her face. I'm a nurse, just here for my best friend's bachelorette party getaway. One last hurrah before she gets hitched. You're a nurse with your attitude? The man scoffed. Hope I'm never unlucky enough to be in your care. I don't act like this at the hospital, Whitney said while rolling her eyes. This is vacation when you're not supposed to work. The older man laughed. You said it, young lady. <laughs> I'm Ken. I used to party like that. I used to drink and dance until 3 a.m. Then I was up two hours later to get the kitchen fires going. I ran my very own restaurant. <laughs> until the old ticker decided to act up. Kent tapped his chest, right about where his heart was. I passed the reins on to my son about ten years ago. And he's making me proud. His husband is running the kitchen, though. I wouldn't trust my boy to boil eggs. Both me and Whitney chuckled before I heard a soft voice clear her throat. I glanced back at the two teens, who now looked awkward and uncomfortable. It made sense, since the closest one to their age was probably Whitney, who was clearly in her early thirties. I'm Amy. The girl half waved. This is my boyfriend, Vincent. My family brought him along for summer vacation. Vincent was doing his best to seem cool, even as he bounced from his heels to his toes with enough anxiety to power this broken elevator. Yeah, what she said. He grumbled, not looking any of us in the face. Nice to meet you two. My youngest daughter's only a few years older than you two, I said, seeming a bit less unknown to these kids. Where is she? Amy asked. She's studying for her degree, just on my own. It was still a strange feeling doing anything alone. I came on this vacation alone. What? Your wife not want to come along? Vincent said in a snarky tone. 
I was thankfully anticipating that question. She died a short while after we had our daughter, I said, without batting an eyelash. The blood drained out of the boy's face. Fuck. Sh shit. I didn't mean... I know. I smiled kindly. You're fine. I glanced over to the final unknown in our elevator, who looked like he was sucking on a sour lemon. We hadn't entertained his complaining, and he was clearly bitter over it. I decided to extend the olive branch all the same. So, looks like we're gonna be here a while. What's your name? I said. The man scowled even more before he grumbled, Robert, and then went right back to his sulking. Well, you couldn't help someone who didn't want to be helped. I turned back to Whitney. So, you're a nurse? Sounds like a hard job. I winced at my own social awkwardness, but Whitney hardly seemed bothered by it. I mean, I won't lie and say it's a breeze. Whitney waved her hand back and forth. But the good days outnumber the bad. I'm glad I could get this weekend off, though. Lately, it's been hard to get any time off, you know? I nodded understandingly. Kent chuckled. I run my own business. I only got time off after I retired. Me and my wife decided to take the kids down to Florida to give their fathers a break they needed. Lucky got them saddled with triplets. The older man pulled his wallet out of his pocket and showed off a dozen pictures folded up in there. The boys are Logan and Jaden. The girl is Sadie. Glad they took the stairs with my wife. They'd be bouncing off the walls in here. In this picture is their surrogate, that woman. It's a hundred pounds dripping wet. I don't know how she managed to carry that many kids at once. Whitney cooed at how cute the trio of children was, and even Amy quietly stepped forward to get a better look. I focused on the picture of the older woman, with hair white as a cloud and a genuine smile. Is that your wife? I asked. Oh yes, uh, my sweet Eileen. Beautiful, isn't she? The twinkle in Kent's eyes was one that made my heart clench just a little. Even if it had been almost 18 years since I lost Monica, it was a glimpse at a future I'd never be able to have. Our 53rd anniversary is coming up in a month. Whitney whistled. 53 years. Damn. And I can't even get a second date. She joked. Kent flipped back to another photo, an old one that was wrinkled with age. I could recognize Kent's ears and lopsided grin in the photo of the 20-something young man in a suit that didn't quite fit. And the woman next to him was, no doubt, Ellen in a cheap white sundress. Our wedding day. I carry it everywhere. Don't fret about that second date, Whitney. You have a lot of time to find the one. You shouldn't rush these things. Whitney twisted her mouth. Maybe. So far, no luck with any guy my age, she said. Kent glanced at me, and I didn't need a crystal ball to predict his next sentence. Well, there's nothing wrong with going a bit older. Maybe even a bit long distance. Say, Christopher, where do you live? I knew my face went red, and the snickering from the two teenagers behind me didn't help. It was an answer to my prayers when the intercom in the elevator kicked on. Hello? Uh, hello? Are you all right in there? I uh, click the yellow button to respond. Thanking every god in the sky, I pressed the button. Hi, yeah, there's six of us in here. We're okay. What happened? There was a pause before the voice responded. Can't really tell. Uh, the elevator's been acting weird for about a week now. Uh, looks like it's finally just stalled out between floors. If you're all fine, just hang tight. We're doing all we can to get you out of there as soon as we can. Before I could respond and thank the guy trying to rescue us, Robert shoved me out of the way and pressed the yellow button. You better! When I get out of here, I expect to have my entire stay refunded and to have my suite upgraded to- Whitney promptly yanked Robert out of the way, causing him to whack his head against the elevator wall in his effort to steady himself. She pressed the button and sighed. Sorry. 
We understand this is out of your control. She glowered at Robert, who sneered right back at her. And we'll be patient. Thank you for all your help, sir. She released the button and waited for a response. Seconds once again ticked by in silence. Then, the intercom shrieked so loudly my eardrums popped. I immediately clapped my hands over my ears to attempt to block out the feedback, but it was mostly a fruitless effort. The intercom wailed for a dozen more seconds before it went out. I slowly lowered my hands and grimaced. <sighs> that wasn't pleasant. Whitney nodded. You're telling me. The intercom shrieked again, and my hands shot right back up to cover my ears. The small space seemed to magnify the sound a hundred times over, bouncing off the walls again and again until my head was crying for mercy. Whitney slammed the yellow button. Stop! Whatever you're doing on your end, it's causing serious feedback in here, she shouted. The intercom stopped making those god-awful sounds, and I sighed with relief. My ears were ringing, and I could feel a migraine starting to flood my brain, but the silence was welcome. I managed to make out a whimper in the ringing and turned to see Amy sobbing. She had both hands clamped over her mouth to muffle her crying, but a few gasped cries escaped. Vincent had taken off his backpack and shuffled through it before he sighed with relief. Found them. It's okay, Amy. I got them. He said as he pulled out a pair of large, bulky headphones. Amy snatched them from his hands and immediately popped them over her ears. She slunk into the corner and sat on the ground, continuing to sniffle. Vincent glanced over at me. She's sensitive to loud sounds like that, he explained, shuffling his feet back and forth. Just leave her be with her music and she'll be able to calm down. Robert scoffed quietly. Nobody likes Mike feedback. She can suck it up, he said. Vincent balled up his fists, but took a deep breath to calm down at the last second. No, Amy is on the spectrum and is having a panic attack because her senses have been overloaded. Talk shit about my girlfriend again. I dare you. I never saw a grown man back down from a kid's threat so quickly but Robert actually took a step back and bumped into the other end of the elevator. I glanced down at Amy, who was staring at her music player, but clearly not really acknowledging it was in front of her. What kind of music does Amy like? Lo-fi. Um, it's really chill sounding. Vincent crossed his arms and dropped his gaze. I think it's boring, but she loves it. I downloaded like a dozen lo-fi compilations for her before we went on vacation. Those headphones block out any outside sound. So even if the intercom freaks out again, she won't be able to hear it. You sound like a good boyfriend, I said. This perked the teenager right up. I'm alright. Amy's the cool one. She didn't even want to skip out on babysitting tonight. I didn't want to deal with her kid brother, though. I wanted Dippin' Dots. So I convinced her to ditch. Her parents are gonna be so pissed. Kent breathed slowly in and out, as if he finally got the ringing out of his ears. They all forgive you. Young kids like you are supposed to act out sometimes. It's part of growing up. I'm not a kid. Vincent grumbled, his face turning red as he realized that saying that had the opposite effect that he wanted it to. I mean, whatever, shut up. I glanced up at that intercom, a little afraid it was going to start making sound again. My ears might have been back to normal, but my head was starting to pound. The ringing in my ears had finally died down enough where I could hear, well, at least mostly hear. Anyone got any ibuprofen or painkillers? I asked as I rubbed my temples. I could use a few. Whitney immediately started digging through her purse. Uh, let's see, I've got Tum, some vitamin C powder. Ah. Here's the Advil. She quietly cheered as she pulled the small packet out. And there's a tiny water bottle in here too if you need it. I gratefully accepted both, tossing the pills down the hatch and swallowing them down with little hesitation. I only took a few sips of the water, reasoning that if we were going to be here for a while, 
I didn't want to be stuck and have to use the bathroom. Before I could hand the water bottle back, the intercom screeched again as it turned on. The feedback wailed for a few more seconds before a voice crackled out in the static. Going up. The elevator jolted, and I instinctively grabbed onto the railing. Robert seemed to relax, though. Finally! We're going to get off of this damn thing! The intercom spoke again. Going down! The elevator groaned before it plummeted. Fast. Far too fast. Both of my hands were on the railing now as the elevator dropped like a stone. As she clung to Vincent, Amy screeched, who held back onto her in mute terror, the color drained from his cheeks. Whitney braced herself in the corner and held Kent up, while Robert screamed at an even higher tone than Amy. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't react. All I could do was hold on as tightly as I could to the railing and watch as the numbers in the corner went down. I thought the next thing I'd feel was the elevator crashing into the basement, but on the second floor it came to an abrupt stop. I nearly hit my head on the ceiling, and when I came back to the ground I sunk down to it, my knees knocking together with shakes. The intercom crackled, and it took me a second to realize that whoever was on the other side was laughing. Whitney, who had somehow managed to stay on her feet, scrambled over to the intercom button and slapped it. What the fuck was that? She yelped. The intercom just continued to laugh and laugh until the elevator jolted again. Going up. Oh, God. I was frozen. I couldn't even breathe, much less get back up. Apparently, that was the right idea, though. Get down on your stomachs! Whitney ordered, dropped, and lay on her front. Cover your head now! The order snapped me right into the action. I scrambled to lay on my front. Robert squished right up against my right while Whitney was almost on top of me to my left. I heard Kent praying quietly from his part of the elevator while both Vincent and Amy were now crying. The elevator rumbled to a stop, and I looked up to see we were once again on the top floor. Going down! The elevator dropped again, and I pressed my face to the floor, hands clasped over the back of my head. With my head covered like this, I couldn't hear anything but the screeching freefall of the elevator we were in. I wondered if my daughter would be okay if I died. I didn't have life insurance. She couldn't afford funeral costs on her own. I couldn't die in here. I couldn't leave her alone in the world. The elevator caught itself again, sending me up into the air more than a few inches before I landed back down on Robert. I apologized when I scooted back off of him, like I could have stopped myself from that. The elevator creaked before it rose again, that same mocking voice echoing out from the intercom. Going up. I don't know how many times we were dropped. Each time I wondered if this was it, if this person somehow controlling the damn elevator finally decided this fall would be the one, the one where we hit the basement at terminal velocity. Images of my mangled body and the wreckage of the metal flashed through my head. Finally, the elevator paused and didn't drop. The intercom stayed quiet. I slowly raised my head off the floor. I could faintly smell urine hanging in the air now. I didn't know who had pissed themselves in fright, but it didn't surprise me. My legs shook as I pulled myself to my feet. I felt sick. Robert was the next to get up, his face a nasty shade of green. He opened his mouth, only to close it as he started gagging immediately. Whitney scrambled up, dumped literally everything out of the purse onto the floor, and held it out. Robert snatched the purse and immediately vomited into it. The smell of puke was pungent, and I barely avoided gagging myself. The only guy who didn't get up was Kent, not through lack of trying. His face was gray as he looked up. 
I can't, can't breathe, he wheezed before he flopped forward again. Whitney threw herself to her knees as she flipped Kent over. She took his pulse and swore quietly under her breath. Christopher, go through his pockets. Look for some aspirin. He's had a heart attack. If I can get him breathing again, he'll need some. Robert, try everyone's phone to call 911, she ordered. Shit. I scrambled to the floor and started going through his pockets. His wallet only had pictures of his family and a few cards. His pockets had a few butterscotch candies, but not much else. I even went through the things Whitney dumped out of her purse on the off chance she had put some aspirin in there. Nothing. Not a single one. All the while, Whitney gave Kent CPR. She didn't stop for over half an hour, even when I heard his ribs crack and break. But Kent didn't come back. When she finally took her shaking arms away from Kent's chest, her head bowed. He's gone. Amy burst into tears and buried her face into Vincent's chest, the teenage boy staring in shock at the body. Even Robert slowly shook his head. You can't? You can't keep going? Giving up? He asked, his obnoxious voice now subdued. I don't think it'll make a difference. Damn it! Whitney wiped a tear from her eye before she stumbled to her feet. She pressed the intercom button. Please. We need help. Emergency help. A man has died in here. If there's anyone there, please. Please help. She let go of the button and waited. There wasn't a response. Whitney shuddered. Robert. Christopher. Help me move Kent to the side. Carefully. I'm sorry. I couldn't save him. Picking up Kent's corpse wasn't something I wanted to do. But in this claustrophobic space, we couldn't just let him lie right in the dead center of the elevator. Luckily, Kent wasn't a large man. He was laid gently down on the left side of the elevator while the rest of us clambered to the right. More tears silently ran down Whitney's face, her cheeks red and blotchy. Is this the first patient you've ever lost? Robert looked up from his phone, where he'd uselessly dialed 911 again. Whitney shook her head. No, not even close. It doesn't mean it gets any easier. That's... that's why I wanted to get a vacation. Seeing so many people die, especially over the last few years. The woman wiped away at her face. Fuck! It takes it out of you. Especially when he didn't have to die. You did everything you could, I said, setting my hand on her shoulder in an attempt to comfort her. It still wasn't enough. Robert glanced down at Whitney's purse, still in his hands and overflowing with bile and vomit. Sorry about your purse. He mumbled. Whitney stared blankly for a few seconds before a half-smile crossed her face. Fuck it. It's a purse. It's a goddamn purse. I don't give a shit, she said with a hysterical giggle. I almost laughed too, but I managed to swallow it down. I didn't need to start cracking now. I had to keep it together while Whitney recovered from the CPR. That desire to keep it together was interrupted by Vincent blurting out, Who pissed themselves? Now the entire elevator was giggling, but not with humor. Just exhaustion, grief, and the fact that we were all trapped without an exit in a fucking elevator while some psychopath was fucking with the controls. It was absurd. Insane. But what else could you do right now but laugh? The laughter slowly died down, and I couldn't avoid ignoring it any longer. It was fucking hot in here. None of us wanted to be too close to the actual dead body, so we were all packed together on the other side. There was no avoiding accidentally brushing up or bumping into each other, so no apologies were said. But this close together was just... unbearably warm. 
It made the vomit and urine smell even worse. I crouched down on the floor as my head spun in circles. Whitney rested her hand on my shoulder. You okay? A bit dizzy. I'll be okay. I wasn't going to point out the smell. For one, that was pointing out the obvious, and for two, I didn't want to seem like I was blaming the sick and terrified people after the elevator dropped us. It's just... hot. Whitney nodded. Just stay down there, then. Listen, I'm still not getting any signal in this damn box. But I'm still going to keep trying to call 911. You guys should probably do the same. If we're lucky, they'll send the cavalry to rescue us. I nodded and pulled my phone out of my pocket. The other times in my life I'd called 911 flashed through my head. There was that kid about to take a header off my work building. The woman that had a seizure in the grocery store and hit her head real bad. And, of course, when I came home to find my wife collapsed on the living room floor. Her lips blue and our daughter screaming from her crib. It's hard to forget things like that. But when I brought the phone to my ear this time, instead of the operator asking what my emergency was, it was just dead silent. We silently kept calling 911 for almost an hour before Robert was the one to speak up, much to my surprise. I shouldn't have been in here in the first place. He lowered his phone and rested his head on the elevator wall. My wife rode my ass when I stayed back in the room. He chuckled humorlessly. <laughs> but I dug my heels in. I told her I had to finish this call. I wasn't thinking about anything but myself. Not my kids, not Clara, none of that. Just what I had to do to close this deal. I shall be with them right now. What was I supposed to say? I just stared at him. Vincent was the first to reply. At least the elevator wouldn't stink like puke if you did, he said. Robert snorted. That's true, he agreed. If this is some fucked up lesson from God about my life's priorities, I think I've learned it. He stared at Kent. The guy was happy. He had a family. And now he's gone. I'm sure as hell not happy. I should be with my family. Whitney looked over, a tired smile crossing her sweaty face. Sometimes it takes a tragedy to get your shit together. You still got time to fix things. I will. As soon as we get out of here, I will. Amy pulled off her headphones. The girl's face was still puffy and wet with tears. My phone's dead. She murmured quietly. It's okay, Amy. Whitney reassured her. I'm never gonna run out of babysitting ever again. Amy shook her head. My brother's not even that much of a pain, you know? He can't even be really sweet sometimes. I'm such a jerk for running out of the hotel room like that. Vincent wrapped his arm around her shoulders. Hey, no, no. This is my fault. I was the one who talked you into taking off as we did. When we get out of here, I'm going to spend all the time making it up to you and your little brother. We'll bring him ice cream, okay? Amy bobbed her head up and down. It was rather sweet, this moment between these two kids. It almost made me feel better about being trapped. Then I heard a buzzing. I turned my head about and frowned. Do you guys hear that? I asked. It didn't sound like a mechanical buzzing. It sounded like... insects. The top of the elevator made a scraping sound, and I looked up to see the vent twitch and open. My stomach dropped as that buzzing got louder. Hit the deck! I shouted before I covered my head. Everyone dropped to the ground, Robert nearly toppling right into Kent's body but managing to catch himself at the last second. A gray blur dropped into the elevator, bouncing off the floor. I barely recognized it as a wasp's nest before it exploded into angry, stinging hornets. I regretted my lack of pants and long-sleeved shirt. 
Even if it was over 90 degrees out, it left me so much more exposed to these stinging insects. The first stab of a stinger hit me right in the knee, and I cussed myself blue as I squashed that little fuck into the carpet. Please tell me no one's allergic to fucking bees! I shouted as I kept on crushing the wasps into the floor and into the wall. I didn't get a response, but they might have not heard me. The buzzing was so loud it made my ears ring. I dimly remembered my daughter rattling facts off about stinging insects, about how honeybees only got one chance to sting before they died, but wasps could sting all they liked without care. There was no waiting this out. I gritted my teeth before I got up and started crushing as many wasps as I could. Whitney got up too, her arms already swelling with quite a few red welts, but she started swatting and smashing these yellow bastards. Vincent and Amy stayed on the ground, Vincent trying to protect Amy with his body as Amy cowered. Robert just held his arms above his head as he remained very carefully still. I wasn't going to bitch at him for that. There were probably hundreds of them. They stung my face, arms, and hands, and legs, and they kept coming. I could hear hysterical giggles from the intercom once again, but I didn't care. I just kept killing wasps as fast as I could. The swarm was mostly gone by the time I allowed myself to drop to the ground. Everything felt like it was on fire, but I could still breathe. Whitney was in a similar condition, sweat plastering her hair to her forehead and neck, but she could breathe. Vincent slowly unfolded himself from around Amy, his eyes nearly swollen shut. Did you kill them all? He asked. I was about to respond when Amy wheezed. She looked up, and she somehow looked worse than the rest of us. Blotchy red hives covered her face and neck, while her lips were starting to look a little blue. She gasped, reaching out to Whitney before flopping to the ground. Help! Help me! Oh, fuck! Whitney threw herself to the ground and examined her. Did you know she was allergic? No, she's never been stung before. Oh my god! Oh my god, no! Amy! Vincent was now sobbing this poor boy unable to do anything except stare at his dying girlfriend. Robert shoved me aside, and before I could ask what his deal was, he produced an EpiPen and stabbed Amy right in the thigh, right where you're supposed to. Amy gasped in, and immediately she started to improve, color returning to her lips and her breathing starting to even out. Oh, thank God you had an Epi. Whitney laughed with relief before she looked up, and then all the color drained from her face. Robert? I looked up at Robert. If I thought Amy looked bad, Robert was rapidly looking far worse. He couldn't even speak. He just wheezed a little before he dropped. I almost broke. I almost started bawling like a little kid. I would have been rocking back and forth and utterly useless if Whitney hadn't literally slapped me to force me out of my shock. Help me get Robert in a position he can breathe in, now. I managed to swallow down my hysteria and grabbed onto Robert. Whitney twisted his head and I could hear him gasp as he tried to force more air down his lungs. Whitney scrambled as she searched for anything on the ground, anything at all that could help. Then Vincent jumped onto the railing and quite literally punched the ceiling panel. I heard something in his hand crack, but what was far more effective was the yelp I heard above the elevator. Let us out of here, you dumb fuck, or I'm coming up there! The teenager hollered. The intercom wailed as it turned back on. That won't help. The voice hissed, now sounding pissed. It'll make me feel better. Put us on the ground floor. Nice and slow, or you're gonna get screwed over with us. Vincent screamed as he pushed the panel again, forcing it open just enough for us to catch a glimpse of a figure in the dark shaft. The teenager's hand was already turning a hideous shade of purple. I'll fucking kill you! Let. Us. Out! The figure paused before he seemed to skitter away into the dark. 
There was a moment's pause before I heard the elevator clunk, and it slowly went down. My stomach twisted as I half expected it to start free-falling again, but it didn't. The elevator doors opened onto the ground floor, much to the surprise and shock of a half-dozen patrons and some repair guys. Holy! The people in there! Someone blurted out before Whitney scrambled to her feet. Call 911. We have a man suffering a serious allergic reaction in here. Everything following was a blur. I had a shock blanket wrapped around me. I saw Robert being loaded into an ambulance with an oxygen mask on his face. Vincent and Amy clung to each other, Vincent refusing to leave her side even to have his clearly broken hand treated. Kent's body was placed into a black bag while his elderly wife and young grandchildren sobbed. The only thing I remember clearly was a nondescript man approaching me, who I initially thought was another EMT. He looked abnormally normal. You could see his face and then immediately forget it. He leaned down a bit next to me, and for a moment, a dark smile crossed his face, and he whispered two words. Going down? With a pat on my shoulder, the man disappeared back into the crowd, like he was never there in the first place. Winter time was the worst. Where I live, during the darkest part of winter, sunset begins at 4 p.m. and the sun doesn't rise again until 8 a.m. And it is in those dark hours that I lose all control. Over time, however, this morning, amnesia became a daily occurrence. It began inconspicuously enough. I would wake up in my apartment not having remembered the night before, a feeling that, while unpleasant, wasn't altogether uncommon. And more worryingly, in almost every instance I would wake up in a different part of my apartment than where I had slept. My situation became even stranger as I noticed changes during the day that were clearly caused by my mysterious activities during the night. At first, it was little things. My apartment would look different in the morning, with certain objects being placed differently from where I had left them. Sometimes the furniture would be rearranged or the apartment cleaned. But the strangest thing was how my friends would describe my behavior from the night before. They would talk about how much fun I was or how they enjoyed our time together. I looked at the photographs they would show me, and they looked as if they were from another world, or another time, not simply the night before. My nighttime doppelganger looked exactly like me, yet something about his appearance looked unsettling, and shall I say, foreign? I had to figure this out. I set up a camera in my apartment and sat at my kitchen table, waiting for sunset. Of course, I woke up the next morning not remembering a thing. I checked my camera. I watched as I saw myself sitting at my table impatiently, looking at my watch. At 6.42 p.m., when sunset was on this particular day, I saw myself get up, walk towards the camera, and, with the push of a button, turn the camera off. I sat there in silence. I replayed the video to see if there was something I missed, but I knew that I hadn't. I looked at my nighttime self, and while there was no outward change in appearance, my eyes and my movements looked as if it was a different person. The terror of it all made me want to try and forget any of this had ever happened or wish it out of existence, but I knew that was impossible. After the terror and confusion had worn off, and rationality returned, I steeled myself to continue with the investigation. My first experiment determined that I did become someone else at sunset. 
Now the question was, could I communicate with this person? That same evening, I once again sat at my kitchen table. This time, I began writing a letter. Good evening. I don't know who you are, but I know you know who I am. Who are you? Why are you here? Why do you take over my body every night? Regards. After a day of mulling over what to write, I decided that a simple message would do. I expected a simple message to be sent back to me. The next morning I woke again at my kitchen table with the pen in my hand. For a moment I imagined this whole bad episode to be over. However, as I looked at the piece of paper in front of me, I saw that it was far from over. In handwriting quite different from my own, I read the following. Hello. Does anyone know why they exist or who they are? I too have done my investigations, trying to determine the nature of our relationship. It appears that, yes, I only begin to exist at sunset and disappear again at sunrise. I have no memories of what happens during the day, just as you have no memories of what I do at night. But perhaps it is best if I start from the beginning. I woke up one night in a state of confusion. The feeling was difficult to explain. I felt as though I had been in a dream, watching your life pass by, and now I had been awakening. As I've mentioned, I couldn't remember the daytime. However, I knew every other aspect of your, or shall I say, our life. I knew our friends, family, job, and history. I knew everything. The first few nights, I simply sat in our apartment, reading mainly and thinking. I would wake up every night simply assuming that I had fallen asleep. I then began to move things around solely for my comfort. When these things were in a different position, I first began to contemplate the possibility of your existence. I was initially terrified. Who was this person taking over my body during the day? After those first few nights, I began to venture out. I would spend nights in the city looking at the stars and wandering the streets. And yes, I would spend evenings with our friends. I knew them, and yet I didn't. I remembered them. However, for some reason I could see them in a different light, like looking at a painting from a different angle. Or more aptly, it was like looking at the sketch that lies beneath a painting. But not only did I see our friends differently, I could also see our own life differently. For, you see, it was after spending evenings with our friends that it dawned on me who we were. I began to see how they all looked at us. They looked at us not with ridicule or loathing, but with pity. They pitied us. And I understood them completely. I saw your life, your pathetic little life. I saw your ineptitude, your laziness, your abject lack of ambition. I saw the waste that was your very existence. I was filled with a wave of dark anger. How could you do this to us? For many nights I stewed here alone contemplating what to do until it finally dawned on me. I know you more than anyone else can possibly know you, and I know deep down that you know me too. With this in mind, a plan began to formulate in my head. Therefore, I come to you not to demand, but to ask for assistance. Please help me. You have seen the promise of what I can achieve with our body, even with the hindrance of nighttime. However, despite this, 
You are still in command during the day. I need you to follow me. You may not trust me right now, but I have no sinister motives. Think of what we can achieve. That is all I have to say for now. Wait for my messages in the morning. Good night. I closed the letter. Once again I was filled with terror and confusion, but he was right. He knew me better than anyone else could know me, and he knew that despite his ridicule of my, how did he say it, pathetic little life, I would not be angry. He knew that I would submit to his will. I spent the day in a blur, thinking about his words. A strange feeling came over me, a happiness I couldn't understand. I felt that I would no longer be lost, that someone was here to save me. What followed would prove to be the best months of my life. After the dark winter days came the spring, and he would leave notes for me every morning. Most of the time it would simply be to run errands during the day. I would buy him a suit, exercise according to his routine, or get the haircut he thought appropriate. Sometimes he would leave a note saying, have a nice day, or thank you. He would also apparently finish my work at night, leaving me the entire day to do as I wanted after I had completed his course of instructions. The world began to look different as a certain calmness overcame me. Each morning would bring the excitement that I had never felt before or had not felt for many years. The biggest change, however, was in my social life. My friends, who, according to him, had looked at me with such pity, now treated me with a quiet respect. When this change is caused not by one's doing, it can be rather startling. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed every single moment of it. During the summer months, the longer days meant that he was restricted to four or five hours a night. On these mornings, he would leave more detailed and intricate instructions. In addition to the usual errands, he would also instruct me on what to wear, say, and behave. I learned quickly, knowing that he would be there to guide me, but it wasn't easy. Towards the end of my summer, I made more mistakes, or sometimes I would simply forget to carry out certain instructions. I would wake up to long, angry letters with him admonishing me for my failings. At first, I would hit back, purposefully disobeying his orders, but I soon found that this small act of rebellion was futile, and any act of disobedience was met with equally harsh punishment. His will to succeed was clearly much greater than mine, and so was his vengefulness. After summer, autumn came. And with the increase in nighttime hours, he seemed to resume his work with new energy. He had asked me to resign from my job so he could take a remote role with a company based on the other side of the world. In this way, he would completely control my job and our finances. Our relationship began to mend as I again submitted more of myself to his will. His new job had improved our financial situation substantially and we had moved from our small apartment into a large house. I didn't know what he did, nor did I ask. I continued to follow his instructions and reap the benefits of his work. As the days became shorter and the weather colder, I found myself with nothing to do on most days. There were not a lot of daytime hours, so I would spend it mainly reading or taking long winter walks. His instructions had stopped, as I think he didn't need me to run so many errands anymore. I began to feel like a passenger in our own life. On one winter's day, as I prepared myself for another day of reading, I noticed a note left on top of my favorite book. It read, Release me. Release me. The bluntness of his words startled me. My mind blurred as it felt like his world was beginning to seep into mine. 
but I defiantly carried on, for as much as he was master of the night, I remained master of the day. The next day he once again left a message for me. This time he had scrawled it on the cover of my book. Release me. This continued for several days as he left more messages, sometimes scratched into the wall or in my book. He smashed mirrors and broke furniture, destroying our house. I could feel his anger, yet I remained unflinching in my desire to remain my own person. Finally, I found myself waking up locked up in one of our rooms. I pounded at the door, although I knew no one could hear me. I searched the room, but I could find nothing. It dawned on me that if he was to wake up in my body, he would have the means to get out. For three days I woke up in this room, and I could feel myself weakening each day. During the evening of the third day I found myself at my lowest point. I was a slave to his will, and I knew I would never be released unless I gave in. I felt resigned to my fate. I got up from my corner of the room I'd been sitting in to peer through the window high in the wall. I looked at the sunset for the last time before my world started to fade to black. But I don't disappear, not entirely. I could now see through his eyes during the day, although I had no control over his actions, and my eyes were obscured with a perpetual dimness, an eternal setting sun. For years, all I could do was watch. I watched as he fell in love and got married, as he held his wife during their first dance. I watched as my family and friends looked on and could see their happiness and pride. I watched as they had their first child and the child recognized his face for the first time. I watched as their family grew and he added two more children. For years I watched, helpless and powerless, as he took over my life. But I was not angry. Anger would have been a much more pleasurable feeling compared to the eternal sadness that had become my life. The thought caused my unbearable sadness that he was right. My existence, my very essence as a human was nothing but a waste. One summer's day, as I watched him take his family to the park, the dimness was slowly lifted. The sun shone in my eyes as I felt warmth for the first time in six years. I moved my arms and touched my face. I felt older, but I still felt like myself. I looked over at my child, laying on the picnic blanket. I reached over and touched my child for the first time. I lifted her and held her head to my chest. She giggled and laughed as I hugged her. She called me daddy. And I cried as I had never cried before. But these were not tears of joy, but tears of sadness because I knew what he knew, and I knew that in a moment the dimness was going to return. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity. And it was not meant that we should voyage far. H.P. Lovecraft Meyer Danforth was as kind a man as they came. A good father, hard-working husband, and an amazing grandfather. He was my grandfather. Above these, Grandpa Danforth, Papa Dan I used to call him, was an amazing storyteller. He always loved to tell me stories of his times when he was young, particularly about the times he'd go around looking for a scoop for the papers. 
He used to work as a columnist for the Weeping Willow Ledger back in the day. He had enlisted for a short time in Vietnam where he wrote for their newsletter as well. Those he obviously was a little more hesitant to talk about. I never really pushed him much about it either, having been told many times by my folks that that was not something you should ever try to push a person to talk about. Sometimes, when I'd get extra lucky, he'd actually tell me about one or two times where he actually got a laugh while stationed in a watchtower in Saigon with his pals in arms. One thing he'd always told me about was his dream to want to travel the world. One of the reasons, of course, he'd joined the army. When he came home, I remember Grandma telling me just how much of a different man Papa Dan was. War does things like that to men, she said. She shook her head when she said this, staring off to the right, ironically the same way you might expect a veteran to do coming off the battlefield. Something Papa Dan did do on occasion, usually when something was stressing him. Something I should make clear is that my grandfather was, at least from what he'd tell me, a strict non-combatant. He was a CO, but still wanted to pursue a passion in writing, as well as serve his country. Again, that's what he always told me. God only knows whether or not he actually did take up arms against the VCs, and I'm sure not even God would actually blame him if he did, and couldn't bring himself to share anything like that, even with his family. Like I said, not something you're supposed to really press them about. Whether he ever took up arms and spilled enemy blood or not, though, it was clear that something had haunted him from his service days. He never became an alcoholic or anything like that, surprisingly, but Grandma told me of times where his temperament would sometimes make her want to down more glasses of wine than usual. As well as this, she told me of times where she had walked by a room in the house only to find Papa Dan knelt down on the floor, almost in some sort of prayer she described, while whispering in these weird tongues. When she'd say something to him about it, apparently he'd then snap and devolve into a sobbing mess. He'd always shout out these names all crazy-like, she said to me. Names? I asked. You mean perhaps his platoon? Some of them, I guess. He'd shout names of people he'd show me in his army photos, sure. But then there were others he'd shout out. I raised my eyebrows. Others? She nodded and replied, yeah, ones I'd never heard before. Ones I'm not even sure were even real. What do you mean? I... I don't really know how to describe them, Andy. Other than they sounded similar to some old pagan or voodoo gods or something. She stared off to the right of me for a moment again, narrowing her eyes, losing herself in concentration. Suddenly, I heard her begin whispering. Jubilex, Zansis, Melios. Jubilex, Zansis, Melios. What? I asked. She didn't reply. She didn't notice me at all, in fact, or so it seemed. I could hear continued muttering. She was right about them being near impossible to really describe as well. Adrayak, Adjuin, Jehovah, Kaios, Ralik, Jehovah, Adrayak, Melios. I remember vividly how much this frightened me. A 17 year old kid by that time. I would have almost sworn I was watching my grandmother being possessed by a demon. I had to shake her lightly to bring her back to her senses. She was startled a moment before relaxing again. Grandma, what was that? Was that what you were hearing from Papa Dan? With a grave expression, she nodded her head. After that, nothing further was discussed about that or about his time in Vietnam between me and her. Papa Dan hadn't said much about it either after that day. He would still tell other stories, of course, usually just the ones of numerous antics he and his friends would pull on the schoolyard. Those were always amusing, even if he did end up repeating a few of them. 
But of course, they wouldn't have my interest, my curiosity, the same as the mystery of what had happened to him during his time in the army. You may be thinking that I'd have the good sense God gave a tree stump not to ask him about the weird chanting Grandma told me about. Sadly, you'd be dead wrong. It was a few months after the day that I'd talked to Grandma about it that he and I were sitting around the fire pit, sharing two six-packs of Budweiser while he told his stories. It was something the two of us did just about every weekend ever since I turned 16. Two guys sharing shitty beer around the fire. I guess to my credit you could just as easily pass this incident off as me down in one too many and clouding my better judgment. Regardless, things got quiet, settling down, with the flames themselves even starting to die down the embers. That was when I asked him, Papa, who is Jubilex Xanthus Melios? He looked at me for a moment, eyebrows raised in confusion. That name, who is it? What? What name? That was when I started to see his body slowly beginning to tremble. It was faint, but still just noticeable enough. I've heard you whisper that name, as well as some of the members of your platoon from back in... I froze there. Papa Dan had the look of someone who'd just been shot. Where did you hear that name? He barked. This caused my heart to jump into my throat. I opened my mouth wanting to speak to either try and change the subject or to come up with an explanation. Nothing would come out, though. Papa Dan's body was now shaking a lot more violently. I was bracing myself for him to lunge forth from his chair and come at me. He wasn't violent, or at least, again, not that I was aware of, but his shaking, the abrupt shift in tone, and the crazed, almost deranged look he had on his face made me wonder if he might end up breaking that little perfect streak, you know? Fortunately for me, he did no such thing. Instead, he just leaned forward, pushing himself uncomfortably close to my face and whispering, shuddering, Get the hell out of my sight, boy. For a second, I didn't move. I couldn't. At the snap of his fingers toward the house, however, I snapped out of my stupor and quickly got up to leave. Before I got two steps from the fire pit, though, I felt him grab my wrist. Hard. I stopped and turned. He stood up and once again got in my face and whispered, And so help me God, if you ever say those words in my presence again. He trailed off, keeping his face chiseled in horror and perhaps sadness. Terrified out of my mind, I promptly stumbled as fast as I could back into the house. He didn't follow me. He stayed out there all through the night until sunrise. I didn't sleep that night and I don't imagine he did either, though obviously for two different reasons. I was afraid that at any moment he'd come back and want to beat the hell out of me for triggering albeit inadvertently, some sort of horrid memory for him from his war days. I think he was afraid that whatever or whoever I'd said the names of were going to come for him because I'd somehow invoked them or something. That morning, I remember he came in and I wanted to talk to him, tried to apologize or bury the hatchet between us. But he didn't seem to see me and instead went straight to his own bedroom. I noticed he still had that deranged sort of sunken look chiseled into his face when he did this. Admittedly, I was scared. Scared that he'd hate me. Scared he'd kick me out. Which would have been bad for me, given that I had nowhere else to go after I was taken out of my mother's house when I was young. But honestly, I was even more frightened at the idea that I'd done something to him that could have pushed him over the edge. That my little stunt from the night may push him to... Well, well, to my relief, it never became that dire. In fact, it seemed more to me that he had actually moved on from it. He never looked at me the way he did that night again, nor was the subject ever brought up again. Of course, that was also the end of our weekend hangouts around the fire. Not like I was in any objection after that night, though. Despite it never being brought up again, though, it never stopped being something that had my head racked at nighttime. 
For years after that, I'd lay awake for hours wondering not only who Adriak Jubilex was, but who he was to my grandfather as well. I never again mentioned it to him or grandma or anybody else, but I never forgot, and I never stopped being curious about it. Jumping ahead to about 2009 or 2010, and I was then 24 and on my own. Both Grandma and Papa Dan had passed away. Grandma was the first to go, with Papa Dan following behind only three months later. I remember it was then that, for the second and last time, I saw that look on Papa Dan's face. The look of horror and sorrow. He was in a bad state of health by that point to the point where anything but breathing itself was a struggle for him. Coughing and wheezing, I heard him choke out the question, <coughs> Andrew, <coughs> do you remember? I knelt down by his bed. Remember what, Grandpa? I asked. <coughs> that, that night, around the fire, my own eyes went wide and I nodded. This caught me off guard for two reasons. First, because of the fact that he actually remembered that, but secondly, because I wasn't sure how he was going to react now that the subject was breached again. I knew he wouldn't be able to fly off the handle like he almost had that night, but I was still very much concerned about the effect it'd have on him now, bedridden with one foot in his grave and the other tap dancing around it. <sighs> Listen, he wheezed. Listen to me. There's... He jerked with a whooping cough before rasping. There's a journal at the old house. When it's... When it's time... His eyes became heavy and his voice became faint. The EKG beeping began to pick up rapidly. I could hear the nurses coming down the hall as I masked the assistance button. Papa Dan continued to fade as I heard him whisper. Read it. It's my... My biggest story. His eyes closed after that, and his breath became relaxed. I tried to shake him a little, but it was no use. He was out cold. The beeping became frantic for a moment, and the last thing I heard before the nurses flooded the room and ushered me out was a single word. Obelisk. I left the hospital after that in a daze. That would, unfortunately, be the last time I ever saw my grandfather. He passed away that following morning, peacefully according to the doctors. The next few days after that, for myself and the family, were a bit hazy. His funeral was that following week and we had him cremated. Following this was when we began going through his will. He left me the house and everything in it having apparently decided long ago that my mother wasn't deserving to take it. I decided I'd sell the house after taking whatever was of any real value to me or the family out of it. That's what led me to the journal I assumed Papa Dan was referring to that day. It was when I was going through his old room, searching through all of his old books, fishing rods, and even a few of his old journaling notes. Scattered underneath these was an old photo of Papa Dan, However, I could tell that it wasn't like the one I mentioned before of him and his platoon in Nam. In fact, I could tell this wasn't even Vietnam where it was taken, nor were these soldiers or military personnel standing in the photo with him. They all wore these black polo shirts with a giant N plastered over a three-point star and khaki shorts. These, I figured, must have been a tourist or journalism crew he had ran with back in the day. The photo was dated 10-13-1964. He had been sent home from the service only a couple of months later, in January of 65. I wondered then who these people could be, and or how he could have met them if they weren't military personnel. The back of the photo read, in bold red letters, 
Your country might have forgotten you, but I haven't. Someday our story of what happened that day will be told. I then began to rummage through the other papers gathered there. Through the miscellaneous mix of letters to editors and the notes of other columns he had wrote, I found a small, dusty, red leather-bound book. It had a lock on the front with no title. It took me another ten minutes of rummaging, but I managed to find the key and unlock the book. Immediately, a bunch of small pieces of paper fell out of the front of it. I ignored them, though, as the first page had those haunting words written on them. Bold and red, just like the photo, in my grandfather's handwriting. Adriach Adue Jubilex Zanctus Melios Now, all but spellbound, I hastily scrambled to collect the other slips of paper off the floor before leaving the old house and taking the book with me back to my apartment. From there, I spent the entire rest of the next week and a half reading the journal. By the time I'd finished even half of the journal, I knew why Papa Dan was so afraid that night, as well as why he wanted me to find this journal. The following is the account of Meyer Danforth and his team in Egypt in what he had referred to as the Obelisk. September 4th, 1964. The weather here has been hot. Miserably so. Men here wonder how the Kongs have always done it. Managed to move around so well when the heat alone was likely to sear the skin right from your bones. Some wonder if they're even human at all. Personally, I could care less. The heat may be bad, but compared to the other burns I've suffered in the field, it's now more a mild nuisance to me than anything else. What's more important was that I was given the opportunity of quite possibly a lifetime. Two days ago, a telegram was mailed to me from an unknown organization, Tri-Nexus, requesting that I attend some sort of a meeting in Plyme tomorrow night. Details were sparse, but I figured that being that the time was promised to be compensated and there were no strings attached, what was the harm? Worst comes to worst, I simply say no to whatever it is and come back here to Saigon. Western Union Telegram To Danforth M., your presence is requested on behalf of the Scientific Community of America to attend the briefing conference. The conference is set for 1100 hours on September 6th. There is no obligation to attend, however we promise that the time will be compensated financially should you choose to attend. We hope you will choose to attend. Sincerely, Tri-Nexus Corps. September 6, 1964 I went to the meeting yesterday. Let me say that I was astonished at first. The representatives of this Tri-Nexus Corps explained that they're a budding subsidiary of NASA, one specially designed for cosmic, spectral, and or generally unexplainable phenomena. They claim to be stationed currently somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere in Cairo, I believe. Apparently, the purpose of this meeting was to pitch a proposal to myself and a group of others, archaeologists, I believe, by the looks of them. This made sense to me, given how much the Tri-Nexus representative spiel seemed to hold their attention. I, on the other hand, had very little clue on exactly what the hell was being said. From what I could make of it, he was proposing some sort of exhibition to the old pyramids of Egypt. What they want from there wasn't made clear. I would have asked, however, I was quickly buried beneath all the others in attendance with questions of their own. Ones that the representative was likely far more interested in answering than the purpose of this crusade. I'd have left then and there, had the promise of ten dollars per every hour I spent in that conference not been so tempting. Regardless of this, initially my mind was essentially made up that I'd pass on this. As much a golden opportunity as this appears to be, I just can't shake the feeling that there's just too much I don't know yet, both about the expedition as well as Tri-Nexus itself. 
Leastway, judging from the way the others seemed to keep better track of what he was talking about than I, it's likely I would be more of a nuisance than any sort of asset. Admittedly, though, after thinking about it a bit further, I can't help but wonder if I'm making the wrong judgment call. I would hate to miss being a part of what could possibly be something big. Something that could very well build rapport with top-tier journals in the country. I just don't know. We were told that should we be interested in the venture, we were supposed to report to the airport in California no later than the 17th of November, where we had then board a flight to their headquarters in Cairo. To make that deadline, I'd need to come up with a decision no later than the 10th, which would give enough time for me to be flown to the rendezvous spot from Saigon. September 7th, 1964 I talked to one of my friends I made here in the field, Private Reese Elroy. I gave him a brief overview of the briefing conference as I understood it. For two main reasons, I of course couldn't give him much detail. The first being that I was willing to bet money they weren't too keen on the idea of their secrets being shared with those that weren't invited themselves to the conference. The other being the fact that, again, I barely understood any of it myself. I did, however, make it a point to ask him if he'd know any reason they'd want to excavate the ancient pyramids. I figured he may have some sort of clue regarding ancient mysteries never being solved. As it happened, he said offhand he wouldn't know of any such mystery or anomaly. The most educated guess he had was perhaps an investigation into the Great Pyramids of Giza. This could have made sense to me except for the fact aside from its mysterious construction and its endurance through time, there was never any anomalous properties to it. Private Reese Elroy Even still, Reese had made a point that stuck with me. He told me, Who's to say there isn't something else entirely that the world's never seen before? Wouldn't you want to be the one that shares it with the world firsthand? I know if it were me. I'd want to take that bull right by the horns. I must admit, he has a point with this. God himself only knows what sort of unknown phenomenon happens away from the media there, and I could be the first to change that, for American eyes, and possibly the world as a whole. That would be a dream for me. I've always admittedly wanted to tell a story to the world, one with importance. To leave at least one fantastic legacy behind when it's my time to go. I just wish it weren't equally as difficult to justify going because of this. Something being so fantastic yet entirely false. Or perhaps dangerous. Either way, I'm still undecided. I still have another day to request permission from command to leave Saigon for the airport. I just hope there's enough time to make my decision. September 10th, 1964 It's taken a lot for me to even write in this journal right now. In so little time, so much happened. It was abrupt and none of us were prepared. An ambush in the early hours of this morning. All around us, the grass and the trees all screamed furiously at us while simultaneously bursting forth with a combination of both machine guns and artillery tubes. Reese's tower was one of the ones on fire watch when it happened. The enemy was smart, too. They coordinated this little attack in a way that allowed them to take out the watchtowers first using the artillery guns. I remember those were the sounds to wake me up this morning. Following this, I watched men running down the hallway shouting, the commotion raged on outside and I ran out to see, to my horror, all but two of the watchtowers completely engulfed in flames. I wanted to see if Reese might have been in one of the two surviving towers, but was quickly rushed off the field into our safe house, where I ended up staying well into sunrise. I and a few other non-combatants were retrieved when the commotion died down. We had managed to run them back, but at incurring a heavy casualty rate, as well as the loss of our watchtowers. I suppose that was their plan all along, weaken our defenses with a small-scale ambush before hitting us with all they had soon after. 
I found out later that my friend was indeed among one of the watchtowers to fall victim to the artillery shells. Private Reese Elroy is dead. May he find peace in heaven. As for me, it's because of his death and the earlier suspicion of another far deadlier attack from the enemy forces that drove me to accept the decision to join the Trinexus expedition. I still don't know what I expect to find there, what story I'll come away with, be it a fantastic one or not, but it's a story I'd rather tell than the ones I'd find here, in the midst of heartbreaking carnage. The last thing I'll say for the time being is this, no matter what story I tell here, this will be my greatest story. My only hope is that the words here may open the eyes of others to something that was before all but unknown to the modern world. Something less dramatic than the horrors of war. September 16th, 1964 We arrived in California earlier this afternoon. Being a day early, there was no flight waiting for me, nor were there any Tri-Nexus representatives to greet me. This led me to having to rent a cheap motel in a shady part of town. I have to admit, it feels so unnatural almost, being back in such a familiar setting. It feels almost like I don't belong here, having spent so long in godforsaken jungles that it seems more natural to me than city life, despite having actually grown up in the city for most of my life up until the time I was drafted. I'm not sure then whether or not it's a good thing that I'll not actually be staying long enough to reacclimate. I'm not sure I really could if I tried. In any case, I plan to leave tomorrow no later than 8 o'clock in the morning for the airport. I have to say, ever since that night, sleep has been a near impossibility for me. I can't get the sounds of the commotion out of my head. Honestly, that's essentially the only reason I even bothered to write in this damn thing at all today. Sheer insomnia. Perhaps a little bit of excitement about the upcoming expedition is to blame as well. That's a slightly more comforting thought, I suppose. That and the idea that Reese would be proud. That's about all I got now to keep me from going completely off the deep end. Minor excitement and an expectation. I'm taking the bull right by its horns. I witnessed something firsthand, either to fascinate me beyond all belief, or haunt me more than anything else ever could, if that were even possible anymore. September 17th, 1964 It's been at least five hours from the time we boarded the flight to Cairo. Only about half of those that attended the meeting in Saigon actually returned to go through with the expedition, myself included. To say I blame the ones that didn't return would be a lie, but all the same I do pity them. They may never unlock the secrets that, according to the Trinexus Corps, lie entombed with the pharaohs of old. I'd arrive at the airport around 9.15 this morning, admittedly having a late start leaving the motel. When I arrived, I found that the plane had preceded my arrival, along with the Trinexus representatives, and about 12 other men and women, all young and all the archaeologist types I'd mentioned before. Before boarding, the Trinexus representative, Mr. Ronald Benson, once again thanked us for joining the expedition and shared his goal of finding a long-hidden secret beneath the ancient pyramids of Egypt. He, of course, never attempted to specify exactly what secret he was alluding to or how he and the other Trinexus members came into possession of knowledge about such a thing possibly existing. This brought back a bit of my earlier apprehension about this venture. How is it that we're expected to join into something when nothing of its details are made clear? Ironic, really. Such a question coming from someone who had spent at least two and a half years taking orders from military officials. Orders that had little, if any, sort of conceivable rhyme or reason to anyone but them. Still, this isn't the military. I'm not on the base in Saigon anymore. And if I'm not mistaken, these people weren't even military funded either. 
I have to admit that makes me wonder still why it was that I specifically was invited to this. I wasn't all that well known, not even in my own journalism circles. I'd never won any prizes nor even nominated for any. They claimed they wanted an American journalist, an American voice to tell of the events that may transpire to the rest of the country. Somehow, though, I just can't help but feel deep down that that alibi is nothing more than that. An alibi meant to silence me from further inquiries. My only questions, then, are exactly what it is they're not wanting me to tell of and or why. On the lighter side of things, though likely due solely to sheer exhaustion from the past few days of restlessness, I actually feel comfortable here on the plane enough to actually want to try and sleep again. Maybe this time I'll imagine myself in a land far away from here, far from any charted territories. Maybe I'll envision myself upon a long unknown world that had never before been tainted by human discovery. Perhaps, perhaps I'll imagine the very secret of the ancient tombs. September 18th, 1964 It would appear that I spoke too soon about being able to sleep through the night. It's almost two in the morning and I'm unable to stay asleep any longer, though this time it's through no fault of my traumatized subconscious, rather the troubled subconscious of another of the crew members. The young man was Greek thin and tall, having to actually slouch over a bit in his seat to not hit his head on the cargo hold above him. It was around 10 or 11 last night, while myself and the others were trying to sleep, that I first heard him grunting. The others didn't seem to take notice of this, but I did. I awoke to see him thrashing about wildly in his seat. I watched him for the better part of 10 minutes, in which time I also heard him muttering incoherently. Soft as it was, I couldn't make anything of the young man's whispers. Despite this, I was able to discern certain, albeit still strange, syllables in the man's disgruntled speech. Unfortunately, I wasn't listening hard enough to really pick up on any of the syllables themselves to attempt writing them out here. In any event, it wasn't long before the young man settled back into his seat and relaxed. I, on the other hand, knew further rest was out of the question. Once again, forced to cope through this journal through insomnia and anxiety. I will note, however, that the man's mutterings weren't of simple chatter or babble, as is sometimes common with those suffering sleeping disorders, but rather more like those of one suffering a personality disorder. What I mean by this was that, not only was the aforementioned speech in a dialect wholly unfamiliar to any language known to me, or likely anyone else for that matter, I could hear the sounds, the phrases, being repeated, vigorously too, as if it were something significant to him on a spiritual level. Of course, I also understand that this may just be a one-time occurrence that it likely wouldn't happen again and would pose no danger to me, himself, or anyone else. And yet, in spite of even this, I still don't feel safe trying to sleep again. Perhaps I'll have better luck tomorrow. September 19th, 1964 It was a long ride, having gotten absolutely no sleep. I'm having trouble even now. I might as well rename this my Journal of Insomnia. The young man from last night, on the other hand, was almost calm as could be. Almost. He had never been much relaxed ever since the departure from California. I noticed the stoic, almost frightened expression he carried on his face the entire time. I wonder if the two details aren't in one way or another connected. It would, given any other circumstance, be easy to write off the poor bastard's condition as a product of mental disorder. Hell, with the display from last night, I'd have ventured to guess he suffered from an acute schizophrenia, or perhaps even a dissociative identity. Again, under most circumstances, but if I'm not mistaken, each member of this expedition crew had been evaluated some time prior to the flight. I know I was, though likely not quite as extensively as perhaps they were. 
I was given a simple psych evaluation with questions relating to my personal health and well-being and perhaps any family history of mental illness. I would guess that the others, being men and women of science, that they'd be more heavily screened. How he managed to slip by with a glaring stigma such as what I believe I saw last night, I'm not at all sure. From what we've all been told by Mr. Benson, the flight is set to land in Cairo in another three days. From there, he says, it'll take a week or two to be able to arrive at the expedition site out in the desert. I wonder if my mind would be any calmer once we land than it is now. September 23rd, 1964 Quite a bit of time has passed, uneventful. To my relief, I seem to be able to sleep these past few nights with little to no difficulty at all because of this. In only a few more hours, we'll be landing. The only thing of note that's occurred since the last time I wrote was that I saw the disturbed young man from before having locked himself in the cabin restroom yesterday evening. He didn't come out for hours, and when he did, I noticed just how much more shaken he appeared than he had before. What must have occurred in the restroom in that time is anyone's guess, but if I could, I'd bet money that it and the restlessness from the other night are somehow connected. Since then, he's made no other kind of disturbance or had any sort of manic episodes, though. It is clear something troubles him deeply. What it is, I can only imagine. Something has gone very wrong. The Trinexus crew is in a panic. They're trying to keep the peace among the expedition crew, but I doubt any of them are buying the facade that everything is under control. I was both right and wrong about the young man. It's true he was disturbed, and it's true that he'd been suffering some sort of mental illness, at least so it would appear. I was wrong, though, to assume that his condition had subsided after the episode yesterday evening. Shortly after writing the earlier entry, I went to use the restroom myself, where I was met with a scene that sent chills down my back. On the mirror was scrawled in large red letters, a phrase that I'd never before heard or seen. Adrioc, Aduai, Jubilex. Adrioc, Aduai, Jubilex. The words were smeared across the mirror, running down onto the sink. In the sink next to the drain, covered in red, was a small shard of glass from what looked to be a bottle of liquor. Looking down, I found the rest of the bottle smashed to pieces on the floor under the sink. Once the initial shock of the situation wore off, Realization quickly forced another wave of terror through me when I realized that this had to have been the young man's doing. He had been the only one to use the restroom in the time that this had been done. Something I knew from having used the restroom only an hour or so before myself and encountering no such scene. And the bottle which had been smashed was of Greek ouzo. I stared for a moment again at the words themselves. Again, knowledge of what the words are, the dialect, what they mean, and or what significance they had to the young man, are details that are all but lost to me, are details that are all but lost on me. Yet, in a morbid, surreal sort of way, I couldn't help but feel as though they were somehow, somehow familiar. It's impossible to explain, even to myself at this moment. There's so much I still don't know but something about those words resonated with me in a manner that was primal, like I somehow tapped into a dormant instinct when I attempted to sound out the words myself. In another moment, I alerted Benson and two other Trinexus advisors, informing them of the previous incidents involving the young man. Upon investigation, I saw Benson's face bleach white. The others turned away and did their best not to retch. I was told to quietly report back to my seat while they would question the young man. When they attempted to apprehend him, however, they couldn't get him to move. When they tried to escort him from his seat, he fell over limply onto one of the representatives. His eyes were wide and glazed over. I saw them attempt first aid, believing he had perhaps suffered a stroke or a minor heart attack, only to find that he had actually bled out 
revealed by the exposure of the vertical slashes that lined his wrists. Unfortunately, this, of all things that had happened before with the young man's ominous behavior, didn't go unnoticed. On seeing the man's severed wrists, one of the expedition crew members, a woman of middle age, cried out in fright, alerting the rest in a domino effect. Benson ordered everyone to remain calm, but it was another half an hour before the scene died down, and even then, I could plainly see that it's everything they could do not to erupt into yet another panic. The young man's body has been moved to the storage cabin at the back of the plane. As far as I can tell at this time, we are set to proceed as originally intended, despite being down a man. The plane will be landing in Cairo in two and a half more hours. It's getting to be night time again. The plane is silent, but I don't believe anyone can rest right now, and excitement or ambition no longer has any role in it either. September 26, 1964 The past three days have been confusing in a way. A number of ways, perhaps. When we landed in Cairo, we were met by their diplomats. Their lead, a short, stocky man by the name of Rashid Mahala, welcomed us and conferred with Benson while the rest of us unloaded our cargo from the plane. We were told to wait, though, to collect our things until after the young man's body was removed from the cargo hold. During this time, I took it upon myself to ask a few of the others of the expedition crew if they had any clue as to what drove him to do what he did. I found that most of them, however, were none too keen on talking about him or the incident, an understandable feeling. The ones that were willing to talk to me were none too knowledgeable themselves. From what I could gather, none of them knew who he was or had ever attempted to speak to him about anything, including the expedition itself. By all accounts, at least, ironically, until his death, the young man was a ghost. I had also asked if the strange words he had scrawled on the restroom mirror were of any significance to them, if perhaps they had known better of what it was and or what it meant than I, but was met by the same skepticism. Once the body had been removed and loaded onto a truck, presumably to be carted back to Greece, we gathered our belongings and loaded onto the convoy that welcomed us for a drive-through tour of the city. I will say that it is a common place, despite its stereotypes of being essentially a city-sized slum. We were directed to their nicest hotel to lodge for the night. I share a room with an archaeologist by the name of Lionel Ambrose. In some ways, I can't help but be reminded of Private Elroy. He's a young man and seems excitable and ambitious like Elroy was. Because of this, I've done my best to limit interactions with him, even if so much of what appears to interest him likewise interests me. Tomorrow at 9 sharp, we set off to the burial site in the desert. I don't know how much of what happens will be recorded, but I'll do what I can when I can. I have to. For the story. For Private Elroy. October 1st, 1964. It is only after what I had learned a little prior that I continue to write today. In five days, nothing happened. The brief tour and stay through Cairo was a pleasant enough one. The town itself was relatively quiet compared to what I was used to in the villages and towns back in Vietnam. Trader markets served as the primary focal point of the town's activity. Today would mark the fifth day we'd spent traveling to the side of the pyramids. In this time, I decided to ask Ambrose what he believed the purpose of the expedition to be. He answered that he had little, if only a vague clue as to what the Tri-Nexus purpose was for the expedition. I tried my earlier theory with him that it was perhaps connected to the fabled pyramids of Giza, to which he replied that, though a possibility, was highly unlikely. According to him, unofficially of course, he had heard Slip mention of something they referred to as the Obelisk. I asked him if he knew anything of this obelisk beforehand, to which he replied that he hadn't, 
When I asked what his greatest guess was about it, Ambrose simply replied that he speculated it to be nothing more than a symbol or icon of worship that had gone unnoticed by most scholars or philosophers. A simple enough explanation, but one I can't understand, at least not in its entirety. If it were only a lost fragment of worship, a tapestry of a long-forgotten era, then why was it worth this much effort to seek it? What properties could it possess? What secrets could it really hold that would make it such a feverish prize in the eyes of the Trinexus Corps? October 2nd, 1964 It's late. I want to sleep, but this was too important to go unwritten. I have begun having visions as well. Now, allow me to state for the record here that no, I'm not talking about nightmares. Not necessarily. Rather, simply a feverishly vivid dream of strange people. A term I'm obviously using very lightly, gathered in worship around a monument of stone. They all wore these deep red cloaks and shouted to the sky, holding aloft golden images that I couldn't make any details of as a lone figure ascended against the sun above even the pyramids. As a lone figure ascended against the sun above even the pyramids. Through all of this, though, one thing stood out to me. In their mass, I could hear them collectively call out in a strange tongue, dangerously similar to the ones I'd heard on the plane. By this, I mean that the phrases themselves were done in a growling tone, garbled and vicious as though I were listening to an animal trying to speak. From this, I discerned the damningly familiar phrase, Adrioch, Ajuai, Chubalex. That's as far as my vision lasted. This occurred only an hour ago. I wanted to sleep, but questions regarding those words, that incantation. I suppose they were, are, and why I'm seeing such visions has plagued me to such that sleep feels more and more out of the question. My question then is just how long until I too succumb to madness, as had the man on the plane. October 3rd, 1964 This morning has been rough for me, utterly. Truthfully, a part of me fears that the vision I spoke of earlier might indeed have been a product of restlessness, affecting my mind. I've asked around to see if anyone perhaps brought any sort of sleeping medications, to which they all replied they hadn't. Such things were prohibited, something I was admittedly unaware of, but at the same time wasn't altogether unexpected of. Perhaps I was right then about how extensive the pre-screening process was for the others. I also took the liberty of asking Ambrose if he had ever heard of the strange growled phrases and perhaps knew their meaning or what dialect it was even in, as well as if it were even human. A bit to my surprise, he claimed he actually had heard of the phrases before, though couldn't say as to the dialect it was or its translation to any familiar language, other than his speculation that some part of the phrase meant rebirth. When he asked me why I was questioning such a thing, after a brief hesitation, I told him of my earlier vision. The look he gave me still perplexes me to a degree. It was a look that dictated that while he may not have known what it was I was speaking of, he wasn't entirely disregarding it either. Though I believe him when he told me otherwise, I still wonder if he, or perhaps another, either from the Trinexus crew themselves, or from the expedition crew, may have some kind of research on the phrases the people in the vision, or the obelisk itself. If so, it's a matter I hesitate to press too hard upon with them. In any event, I fear that this is something that won't go away until more definitive answers are found. I only hope it doesn't cost me as severely as the poor bastard on the plane. October 6, 1964 Another vision came to me last night. This one was of a tall, imposing pharaoh standing atop the largest pyramid. 
as subjects gathered at the base of it all knelt in reverence and called out to him. Again, the phrase was uttered, though this time mixed with several other phrases. All of it was in that same growling dialect. Adish, Folak, Ioden, Dangor, Kaios, Eli, Kai, Adrak, Melios. Following this, I heard the Pharaoh himself call out in a voice so thunderlessly deep that I knew it couldn't have been human. Uralka, Adrayok, Ralik, Gaan, Tosh, Yehovak, Adrayok, Melios. For reasons all unclear to me, hearing these words once more triggered something inside of me. Something innate, primal, ancestral perhaps even. What was more was when I watched the congregation then turn to one another before brutalizing one another viciously, using staves, chisels, hammers, and soon even their own nails and teeth. I watched them tear each other to shreds. What suddenly provoked them to such savagery and what purpose it was meant to serve is something I hesitate to think of. I can only infer that it had something to do with the mysterious Pharaoh's speech. I didn't get to see if there were any survivors to the brutality. I was shaken awake by Mr. Benson and two of the other Trinex's representatives. Evidently, this vision had an unconscious effect on my physical body, as I was revealed to have been thrashing about wildly as well as caused minor injury to one of the other expedition members by allegedly striking them in the face. Following this, I was forced to isolate from the other members by switching vehicles in our convoy to one that wasn't as populated with others. Benson informed me that in the next week or so, we should be arriving at the site. Somewhere along the way, however, he will require that I undergo another screening exam. In truth, despite what I said earlier, I'm not sure if I want to pass this second examination or not. Ever since that particular vision, I can't shake away the feeling that this expedition is seeking something that was perhaps lost to time for a distinct reason. October 7th, 1964 We've stopped in another city for the night. I'm told that it should only be another two to three days, God willing, before we reach the site. For the reasons mentioned before, I was isolated to a room of my own at the hotel we stopped at for the night. I believe my second examination is tomorrow. Though I haven't had any further visions or episodes, yet, I can't stop hearing certain parts of the phrases uttered from the last dream repeat in the back of my mind. Adreyok. Ka, Adreyok, Ka, over and over, both in the collective applause of the congregation of the hooded disciples gathered at the pyramid's base, as well as the thunderous echo of the shadowed pharaoh at its peak. Unable to stand the mystery for long, I found an opportunity to question Ambrose again, if he may know at least what these two phrases meant. His guess was about as scarce as before, though he did speculate that the phrase Ka may be in reference to the ancient comedic term Ka, referring to one's spirit. To a degree, I suppose this could make sense, though that still leaves the question of exactly whose spirit. At this time, I can only guess that the particular vision I witnessed was some sort of ritualistic Sabbath. The only problem with this conclusion is that I can't tell exactly what civilization it is, one whose religious practices apparently involve genocide. While I'm aware certain Middle Eastern cultures of the time practice human sacrifice rituals, somehow I felt that this was something different altogether, something perhaps as a means of judgment, akin to the biblical rapture perhaps. I think I should mention that this matter isn't necessarily one I feel comfortable dwelling on, but rather one I can't force myself to cease thinking of. For now, the last thing I'll say is that this pharaoh, perched atop the pyramid, 
is no mortal being. Somehow, though whatever means it has at its command, this pharaoh had the capability to bend the minds of men to its will, seemingly effortlessly. October 8, 1964 I was screened again by Mr. Benson and two of the others an hour ago. To put it plainly, I've convinced them of my mental stability, at least for the time being. They asked me again if I had had any history, either personal or familial, with mental illness or sleep abnormalities, both of which I replied that I hadn't. I explained to them that the incident from the convoy was only an isolated incident, one that I was certain was unlikely to happen again. Truthfully, I said this more as a comfort to myself than anything else. God only knows now whether it'll remain true. More and more, though, I get the sickening feeling that what I had witnessed was only the beginning of a far larger, far more gruesome, and far more haunting puzzle. Regardless, they found this answer more or less satisfactory and cleared me to continue the journey. We've hit the road again now. According to Benson, at our current pace, we may be able to arrive by nightfall tomorrow, so long as we continue moving through the rest of the day and tomorrow. I've debated having the gumption to ask him about the obelisk and what its value was, and yet I've thought better of it. Regardless of the fact that I'd just barely managed to convince him to let me continue with the rest of the expedition crew, I also realize that I'm still not entirely sure that is really what he's after here. What's the use of stirring a hornet's nest without at least a concrete purpose for doing so? That said, that hasn't kept me from wanting to look into this obelisk myself. For the time being, I've asked to borrow a few of Ambrose's textbooks of ancient comedic culture. Being that he was the one to suggest it to me in the first place, it stood the reason for me that for now, he'd be my most reliable source to learn more of it. Despite so far finding nothing suggestive of the subject, I figure he had to have learned about the obelisk somewhere, yes? October 9th, 1964 We arrived at the site just before the sun began to set. The site itself is remarkable, I must say, despite not having been in any sort of condition mentally or physically to marvel at it like the others had. I was exhausted, therefore electing to make for the pre-prepared shelters designated to the expedition crew. The others weren't far behind me with this. Due to being cleared through the psych evaluation, I was once again designated to bunk with Ambrose. I also decided against joining the others for chow. I wasn't hungry. Plus, I was by that point far too engrossed in Ambrose's textbook, still trying to find any mention of the obelisk or of the peoples I saw in the vision. I have yet to find either, however. It's late and I think exhaustion alone may force my body asleep any second now. If so, my hope is that my mind is able to rest as well. October 10th, 1964. My wish was almost granted. My sleep had been restful for at least a few hours, perhaps the most peaceful hours I had experienced since leaving Saigon. No visions or sounds plagued me. Then, however, I began to hear the shadowed pharaoh's thunderous voice again. As before, the two words repeated themselves. Adreyaka! 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 No scenery or hallucinations accompanied this. No, it was merely the voice, the booming, unknown tongue of the pharaoh. It was then that I noticed, too, that the repetition of the words occurred at a rhythm, a cadence almost. They seemed to pause in between each utterance. Adreyaka, Adreyaka, Adreyaka. The closer I listened, the less it sounded to me as an invocation or incantation, but rather as, as, well, perhaps a heartbeat. A lone palpitation, a fierce yet steady rhythm. 
It's perhaps the closest thing to hearing the heartbeat of the earth and of the cosmos itself. It was amazing. It was cerebral. It terrified me. So much power, it seemed, carried by a single rhythm, as conveyed through those two single words. Adrayok Ka. This afternoon was largely spent examining once more at the site itself. The site comprised of three pyramids, two of which were smaller in height, though considerably wider at its bases. These beset the tallest one in the center. This one was estimated by Benson himself to stand at least 50 to perhaps 60 feet tall, jutting to the sky as a spear to penetrate the bounds to heaven. Obviously, I was considerably less enthralled by the sight of this marvel, and more so anxious because of it. The realization of its resemblance to the same pyramid found in my visions. I remember looking up at its peak, half expecting the shadowed Pharaoh himself to be looming over us, declaring his alien sermon in his frightening dialect. It was all I could do to not begin losing myself then in front of the rest of the expedition. Much discussion was made as to exactly what we were supposed to do. This is when I finally broke the question of the expedition's purpose to Benson, to which he replied that the purpose laid within the terrifying pyramid. Some ancient artifact, he claimed, which was interred somewhere deep within its recesses, perhaps even entombed with the pharaoh within. What this so-called treasure is, or what its value is to them or to anyone for that matter, he wouldn't say. I didn't push him either, still holding to the delusion that I was overreacting, that this pyramid wasn't the same as what I'd seen before, and that the hallucinations themselves were just that. Hallucinations. Perhaps spurred by a troubled and stressed mind, such as mine is. As much as I told myself this, I can't help but counter the optimism with the sense that reality is far darker than this, that I'm convincing myself of an illusion of safety. The only sort of comfort I had today was the illusion of Private Elroy's face looking down from heaven and smiling that I'd pursued this journey, the journey of uncovering man's lost secrets. I fear, though, even this will soon lose its appeal to me. October 11th, 1964 I'm writing this now, having been involved in an intensive deliberation session on how to enter the pyramid itself. Benson and the others seek to breach through the pyramid through drilling beneath it. The question has been brought up of if such an action would even be permissible by the Egyptian government, to which Benson assured that we needn't worry about any such repercussions from them. Of this, I am admittedly skeptical. The plan as of now is to have a commercial drilling crew, comprised apparently of underpaid construction workers, begin drilling an underground tunnel by first light tomorrow morning. With luck, Benson claimed, we should have a viable tunnel entrance in only another week's time, at which point we'll be able to enter through and seek out this apparent tapestry, this obelisk. All I can say to this is, I feel sorry, both for the construction crew Benton seeks to swindle into this operation, and to perhaps a lesser degree for the rest of us on the expedition crew, having already, I fear, been swindled by him into something truly frightening. The longer I look at this accursed pyramid, it seems, the louder and the more pronounced I can hear the phrase repeat in my head. The more I hear it, the farther my mind reaches to figure out its significance and meaning. The only question is, who can I ask that would have such an answer? October 13, 1964 Like clockwork, the drilling crew arrived at dawn yesterday morning and commenced drilling. That was how I was woken up, though I had already faced trouble yet again sleeping. The crew itself consisted of about 12 to 15 men, all worn and exhausted Egyptians, who I can tell have essentially broken themselves in two to three different ways for most, if not all, their lives simply to make money to get by in a day-to-day -day basis. 
I can only imagine and hope that Benson promised him a handsome compensation for this effort. Should this not be the case, however, I may not be entirely surprised. More and more, I've come to hold a certain distrust for Ronald Benson. From even the beginning in the meeting back in Vietnam, he never ceased to hold information from myself and others. Information that he and I would both know was important to share among the rest of us. I may not know what it is and or his purpose for evading questioning of it, but I know that it could likely affect the outcome of this venture. Not only this, but I'm beginning to wonder if he too is experiencing certain visions as to what I've described as well. Yes, I'd almost be willing to bet on it. For one thing, I've begun to notice signs of fatigue on his own face that reminded me much of the young man from the plane. For another, how and why else when so much information on this supposed obelisk seems so sparse, bordering on non-existent, could he even know about it? More than this, there remains the question of exactly what the hell his purpose for finding it is in the first place. As much as I want to press this with him, I know that wouldn't be wise. Even if I thought there'd be a chance he'd give me an honest answer to the question, I fear he'd have me removed from the project, perhaps as a method of silencing me. Thinking about this, though, I can't help but worry again about my purpose exactly for being here. If such things as my silence would be of concern to him, then why did he adamantly insist that I join this expedition in the first place? October 16th, 1964 Word has it that the drilling crew has breached the halfway point into the tomb beneath the pyramid. Another three days, according to Benson, and we should be able to enter. The man has had these poor souls working day and night, I've come to one conclusion. Liar or not, Ronald Benson is truly a blunt, shrewd, and frankly loathsome man in my eyes. In one of the very seldom occasions I saw any of them given a break period, typically during the day and only four and no longer than two hours, I took it upon myself to ask one of them, a middle-aged Egyptian by the name of Rashad Imal, what he may or may not know about what lays within the tomb. His reaction at first was one I'd recognized as fear, anxiety, as though I'd asked him the name of an ancient evil. When he finally did speak, he informed me that no man has ever truly known what laid within this particular tomb. According to him all, this pyramid had been one reputed to be even spoken of only by infidels, fools, and traitors, as he put it. I attempted to push for further explanation, but found myself quickly losing his favor. I remember he told me that the lord of this tomb was a vile, savage wretch that delighted in the spilling of blood in his name. I once more foolishly asked him all for the name of this infamous pharaoh, for which I was again denied an answer, this time resulting in his insistence that our conversation end then and there. The last thing I can remember him all saying to me is, I pray only that your God can protect you from the might of him within. Others long ago were never as fortunate. If any of you had any sense of reason or any sense of the preservation of life itself, you will go back to your little shelter and kneel beside your bed and then pray that the sense comes to you and the rest to leave this accursed place. Dramatic as I found this statement to be, it's one that I cannot write off as sheer paranoia. Perhaps because much of what he told me appears to correlate hauntingly well with what I've told thus far. Already I was sure this was the tower and pyramid from the vision, and now I'm certain that it serves as the resting place of that long-deceased pharaoh. And above all, I now know that the very sand I stand upon is stained by the blood of an entire civilization that enacted a brutal genocide upon themselves simply in the Pharaoh's name. It was yesterday when I spoke to him all. Since then, sleep has been an almost scientific impossibility for me. Though I've experienced no further visions as before as of yet, 
I still sometimes hear, in the farthest recesses of my mind, the screams of millions as they fall one by one, mutilated, to spill their carnage into the sand beneath them and behind this. In his infamously thunderous voice, the Pharaoh repeats his declaration. October 17th, 1964 Another vision came to me this afternoon. It was just after I'd eaten lunch that I saw it. This, however, was something different altogether from the ones before. These visions didn't take place within the pyramids. As a matter of fact, they weren't of Earth at all. What world, or rather planetoid, this particular scene took place on, I can't for the life of me say. It was a dingy, gray, lifeless-looking place with brick monuments that looked to blend Renaissance-style structures with that of a more Arab-esque tone. It reminded me a bit of the buildings told in the fabled Arabian Nights, large, imposing structures that curve outward toward their peaks. At their peaks were raised long needle-like spires that attempted to stab at the vast outer dark itself. I wondered at first who could have built such magnificent structures, structures that would have made even the most talented of artists, architects, and visionaries sick with envy. Then gathered at what I inferred to be either a village square or perhaps the center of a planetoid itself were strange beings that, at the same time, immediately filled me to the brim with fright and disgust. Long, albino, writhing figures they were, each of them impossibly slender, clad in long robes as depressingly lifeless in color as the actual terrain they stood on. I saw how they appeared to gather at predestined points around the large hole at the center. Eight of them stood around the ninth, which stood next to the devouring pit in the center. Something of note with this, ironically enough I suppose, despite the fact I have remarked how depressing the terrain is, I saw that there were three suns that would orbit this world. Each of them were a varying color and cast a different aura over the land. It was when the second sun, the violet one, had reached its peak height that I watched the figures gather around the crater raise their arms. I hesitate to call them arms, though, as they were more like tendrils. Like the rest of their oblong-shaped bodies, their arms swayed and writhed in the air. I caught a brief closer glimpse of one of the being's appendages where I was horrified to see that on each of them, of which each being had at least five, they all bore a long, elongated mouth. While the other eight stood with their appendages raised, the one in the center next to the hole began slithering out of its robe. Then from everywhere, I heard what I can only describe to be the most ear-splitting, most gut-wrenching, and single most painful collection of high-pitched shrieks ever conceived as the being in the center then cast himself into the hole. It was after this that I came back to reality, albeit dazed and scarred horribly. It was so nerve-wracking for me that I was forced to immediately vomit in the sand where I stood. Fortunately, I was alone so no one would ask any questions. Unfortunately, however, I became very lightheaded and my head pounds miserably, even now. What is worse is that as I write this now, laying ill in my bed, I still can't stop hearing their shrieks ringing in the far corners of my ears. October 19th, 1964 My headache has only minimally subsided since yesterday. At least the sound no longer sounds in my ears. The headache alone was enough to cause me to lose the entire night's sleep. Like that has been anything new though. The insomnia is beginning to worry me majorly. Though I am becoming more and more certain that what I am seeing is more than just a dream, there's still a part of me, a reasonable sense within me, that still holds doubts. It could stand the reason that the lack of sleep is affecting me more and more each day. However, at the same time, how can I be sure it really is merely the product of insomnia? 
How can I be certain that it's an effect of restlessness and not the cause itself? After all, had not the man on the plane seen similar, if not the same hallucinations I've been? And aside from this, if these visions were only phantasm, then what caused the mall such fright to even speak of or be in the presence of this pyramid? All of this has led me each time back to one central question. What is this obelisk and what is its purpose to Benson? Speaking of Benson, I must note how much more noticeable the signs of fatigue are on his face as of late. How irritable he's become as well. I saw just yesterday how, for simply asking for a brief intermission from the day's drilling, having been working for 12 straight hours on that day alone, mind you, he all but ripped the poor bastard's head off, claiming that he was daring to impede the excavation when we were so close to success. Whether suffering from hallucinations or suffering from swelled pride, I'm certain no good can come from any further unnecessary contact with him. I intend to avoid him as much as possible, being perfectly honest. The last word from him to the rest of us expedition crew is that we'll have breached entry into the tomb by noon tomorrow. Then we may all see what was lost to time, the horrible secret that we have broken natural law to pursue, and God himself can only tell what price may be paid for doing so. Something has happened again. Rashad Imal was found murdered only minutes ago. The entire company is in an uproar. There were no sounds or signals of any trouble before, plus I remembered seeing Imal perfectly alive and well only an hour or so before he was found. What could have happened? Who could have done it and why? All of these are questions that are currently being passed around the camp, none of which anyone has a real viable explanation for. I, however, have a different question of my own, one that strangely seems to have passed right over the heads of the others. Where is Ronald Benson? He wasn't there when Emal's body was discovered, nor has he been seen since. The others, likely due to the shock of the situation itself, haven't seemed to notice this. The thing that bothers me most about his absence, though, is the fact that the last time I saw Emal working on the tunnel, he was there, eyeing him with a noticeable anxiety. It was a crazed, almost rabid look in his eye, as though he thought that the tunnel's progress was his life dependency. I say all of this to say that my primary question has only one feasible conclusion, one that I only pray isn't true. Ronald Benson has graduated from a shrewd and lying scoundrel to a full-fledged murderer. I have not shared this conclusion with anyone else as of yet. For starters, there's no way yet to prove that, and secondly, if it was him, it's highly likely his associates may make an attempt on my life to silence me, should they be in on his scheme. As that stands, I already don't feel safe any longer setting foot outside the quarters. As well as this, I've resolved to make sure that my Bowie knife from back in Saigon is within quick reach. I will say this to their credit, the other Trinexus staff appear to be equally shocked at the discovery of Imal as any of the rest of us. I wonder then if they actually know that Benson is missing as well. If not, then I can only wonder what's going through his mind that's made him go rogue like this. In any event, I am thoroughly afraid now. October 20th, 1964 all through the night, all of us of the expedition crew were ordered to remain inside the quarters, while the digging crew was ordered to remain for questioning. For over an hour, this lockdown was in effect. Afterwards, word was released that the expedition crew was to report outside for an announcement. When we all came out, two of Benson's advisors announced that each of us would undergo questioning, both to the possible events of Imal's murder as well as the whereabouts of Benson himself. We were all then isolated by different Trinexus advisors and interrogated. I told them the truth as I understood it, that I had seen them all working only a short time before he was found and that Benson was supervising him at the time. Obviously, I kept my superstitions to myself. 
It wasn't long, maybe only three or four minutes, before I was cleared of suspicion. Others took even less time. Once this was finished, it was declared by one of the advisors that in spite of the panic last night, which had halted the progress of the dig, the tunnel had mysteriously been finished and breached into the catacombs within. Immediately, the dots connected in my head. Benson, having lost himself to whatever ambition that drove him to seek this treasure, this obelisk, murdered him all in cold blood before completing the dig himself. Realizing this, I spoke up. Noting that I had told them about seeing Benson at the dig site earlier, I told them that it was likely that Benson was now inside the tomb himself. This was met initially with skepticism from the other members of the expedition crew, but I could see validity from the advisors. For a moment, everything was silent as the three advisors quietly discussed among themselves. In this moment, I remember looking up to the pyramid again, again picturing the pharaoh lording from its peak and the carcasses littering the ground around. Faintly, even now, I heard their screams echoing again, buried under his declaration. Adrayaka. At this time, no official direction has been given yet. The advisors dismissed the rest of us once again before meeting to conference among themselves. This was all two hours ago. It's nearly eight o'clock in the evening and they've still delivered no news. I suspect that plans for a search and rescue attempt for Benson are being made. What method or personnel they'd utilize for any such thing out here, far removed from society and with no present personnel trained for that is beyond me. October 21st, 1964 We've been awakened and it's still early. The sun has only just begun to peak above the horizon. The advisor informed us to be ready in an hour. He wouldn't share as to why. I've gotten dressed and am ready to go or do whatever it is they apparently have planned for us. However, I feel that this time should be spent right in here of the vision I experienced late last night. This time I saw again the pyramid, with the crowd gathered at its base as before. This time, however, the crowd was different. Instead of the disciples and villagers that gathered before, there were an all-new crowd of monks or druids, each of them clad in deep red cloaks that concealed their features entirely. They stood for a moment amid the mess of gore that had once been the congregation from before. All was quiet for a prolonged moment until I watched one of the monks overturn a few of the bodies to find, or finally, that a small child had survived the massacre. The child, having evidently gone feral, was found gnawing on the shredded meat of one of the bodies. His eyes were pitch black, excreting some sort of ichor and growling like a wild dog. I saw the child look up to see the monk above him, dropping his present morsel and attempt to lunge for the monk, only to be caught and seized by the latter before being carried off. With the child held firm, I watched the monks depart from the pyramid with the child screeching and howling madly. This time I did not hear the voice of that horrible pharaoh, but instead the heartbeat I spoke of before. A steady omnipotent rhythm, beating forever and ever to the end of days. When the monks departed from the pyramid, the heartbeat quickened its pulse and I watched the sky begin to wash with the scarlet overcast. The ground started to rumble and I could see the landscape start to change, transforming into... into... It sickens me to recall, but I saw the terrain transform into an undulating mass of flesh. Everything, everywhere all across the horizon was all comprised now of living sinew. Pink, slimy, and repulsive, the flesh soil reverberated seemingly in accordance with the omnipotent heartbeat. I then heard the voice again, the alien tongue of the pharaoh, declare, Adish Alok Auden Adekan Auden Adreyak 
Patriarch Melios. Beneath this, in hushed whispers from an unclear source, I heard these words. What had begun with blood and flesh, so too shall it end, and be reborn in the image of flesh. Following this, I heard the collective wailing of the slain once more, and the repetition of the phrase, Padreyaka. While the flesh soil reformed itself into the familiar desert terrain, I was shaken awake from my trance once again by Ambrose, who had evidently found me in a trance-like state and believed I had suffered a seizure. Since then, I've been doing my best to avoid both physical and visual contact with the pyramid itself. I don't know how much longer, though, I can continue with this expedition. I fear now, more than ever, that I've been glimpsing things, secrets or omens, that I was never meant to and may well cost me dearly. Dear God, they're actually doing it. They're going to have us, all of us, enter the pyramid. The advisor stated that we will have to act as a search and rescue party for Benson, as they're unable to scrounge together a rescue team that it make to the site in a timely manner. They further stated that this was part of the contracted clause that, should an emergency arise, advisory procedures should go into effect, including but not limited to aiding in any rescue attempts for wounded or missing personnel. This was something I had never given much thought to when I signed, though I likewise had no clue of how severe the situation would ever get. Who could have been, really? Who would have thought, signing up for an expedition such as this, that the circumstances would ever become so bizarre. Well, I know I didn't, and I can see by their equally anxious faces that none of the others had either. In any sense, expectant or not, prepared or not, we've been told that in an hour and a half, we'll be entering that blasted tomb in search for Benson. It would be a welcome miracle to find that Benson wasn't in the tomb after all, and that it wasn't he who murdered him all. Callous as it may be to say, though, a part of me honestly hopes he has met his fate within that tomb, whatever that may be. Date unknown. It feels like I've walked for centuries now. This place, this tomb, it's amazing. It's terrifying. It's haunting. It's... it's fantastic. Immediately upon entering, I and the rest of the crew were greeted to a branching network of tunnels that split off into at least four different directions. From there, it was decided that we'd split off into groups of five to enter each of the tunnels. Each group was paired with at least one of the Trinexus advisors, both for supervision and as a source of light, given that everything past the first foot or so was all but invisible. The passages themselves were long, narrow corridors so tight and condensed that each group was forced to enter them single file. The advisors, of course, took the lead while the rest of us followed behind. As each person entered their respective passageway, I watched the darkness greedily swallow them whole. Finally, it was my turn, and I remember standing for a brief moment, frozen in terror. I didn't want to go in there into that fathomless darkness wherein laid one or both of two things, both of which I was certain were pure evil. A long dead yet perhaps still omniscient and powerful pharaoh, or a deranged maniac whose ambition has already driven him to murder once. What if he was expecting this? What if his plan was for the Trinexus advisors to lure us all in, and split us apart to pick us all off one by one in the cover of darkness. This also introduced another, possibly more haunting query. What if this wasn't Benson's will at all? What if his actions, especially the murder of Rashad Amal, were not his own doing, but the influence of another through him? These were the questions that made my legs feel as though the bones within them had been replaced with rubber as I took a shaky step forward, 
and entered the dark tunnel ahead with the others. For about five to ten minutes following this, all I could see in every direction I turned was complete, absolute blackness. The advisor had brought and was using a flashlight, but despite it being an industrial lantern, the illumination it provided was comparable to a firefly trying to illuminate the inside of a small cave in the mountains. Even holding my hands only two inches or less from my face, I still couldn't distinguish any features or outlines of them. I don't know how long it was when we finally did find the source of light from straight ahead. It was a mere speck, a dot, barely piercing the blackness beyond. My group continued into the darkness until we came out into the light to find that it led to another branching path. One was a sort of stone winding stair that ascended to a point unknown while the latter was a sort of inclined plane that simply went straight down to a shadowy depth. We were forced to split up yet again here. The advisor and one other chose to take the ascending staircase while I and the other two, one of which I should mention as Ambrose, took the descending path. It was here that something else threw us all into a state of frenzy. No sooner than the two taking the winding stair had begun their ascent, I began to hear the heartbeat yet again, accompanied by the phrase Adreyak Ka being repeated. Right as the rest of us would have began entry into the descending path, our attention became fixed on the stairs when we heard the sounds of one of the men's screams coming down from the darkness at the top. Before we could investigate, however, the stone floor beneath us began to shift. Each stone moved, all on its own it seemed, immediately throwing the three of us off our balance. When we tried to pick ourselves up again, we watched a large slab of stone lower, sealing off the winding stair, not allowing for entry or exit. The other two were trapped. The three of us struggled for a moment in vain after picking ourselves up to attempt lifting the sealed door. When we realized this was a futile attempt, we stepped away, where the other man with me and Ambrose, a young graduate student from Harvard by the name of Travis Buckner, huddled into a ball on the floor, trembling violently and muttering incoherently. Seeing this, I was briefly reminded of some of the younger privates back in Saigon who were scared out of their minds like young Travis was here. Ambrose, having only given up trying to lift the door, was trying furiously to batter the stone with his shoulder, as if that would somehow work any better. I was the only one that remained composed, something perhaps due from my being used to frightening situations, ones far more exhilarating than this. I ordered for Ambrose to cease his attempt and for Buckner to get to his feet and both to follow me into the descending corridor. They were perhaps naturally hesitant and slow at first to follow, but only after walking about a foot or two past the corridor's entrance, I heard the other's footsteps following behind me. Following this, walking deeper and deeper into the corridor, I heard the shifting of the stones once more. When we looked back, we found that the stone was lowering over our own path, eventually sealing the three of us once more in complete darkness. This almost caused young Bruckner to panic again, until I calmed he and Ambrose down and ordered that we continue forward. We did, and had made it another four or five feet, at least that's what I'm guessing, before stopping again when Ambrose called out to me, noting that Buckner was gone. I turned back. Without a light, I couldn't see either of the two. I called out Buckner's name and got no reply. Ambrose told me he'd been right beside him the whole time until only seconds ago. The two of us began scrambling to try and find Buckner in the dark when a low, droning hum sounded from the other end of the corridor. Looking back, I saw the faint orange glow of torches. Where they had come from and why they had only now appeared, I do not know. I tried calling out again for Buckner. He didn't respond, though instead, I began to hear the chanting again. This time, though, I was able to tell, both from the way the chorus echoed from the walls around us, as well as Ambrose's own shocked reaction to it, that this wasn't another hallucination. 
Someone was down there, doing God only knew what, and God only knew what it meant for poor young Buckner. With this in mind, I told Ambrose to follow me, and the two of us made for the other end of the hall where the chanting was coming from. Reaching the other end, however, we found neither Buckner nor anyone else, but instead a large domed chamber that looked impossibly large and spacious given its outside encasement, with hieroglyphical carvings covering every inch from top to bottom. In the center of the room was the spectacle itself, a large stone obelisk, likewise covered in pictorial carvings. In spite of my anxiety, I couldn't help but take a moment to examine the room, to marvel at just how impossibly large it is. This room alone, I felt, could have easily housed an entire congregation of peoples with room still to spare. The sheer fact alone that every square inch of stone making up the room was covered in hieroglyphs amazed me to nearly no end. Imagine the willpower, the determination. No, the sheer devotion those architects must have had all those years ago when they built this room. The obelisk itself was a crown jewel in of itself, standing easily 15 to 20 feet tall, long and narrow, jutting from the ground as a spear attempting to breach the ceiling. How it hadn't already is a trivial question that persists even as I write this now. Before I knew it, Ambrose was charging headfirst to call out for Buckner. I went after him and immediately upon setting foot inside the chamber, before I had any time to react, the doorway shifted and was sealed once again. Ambrose and I were trapped now in that room, trapped with the obelisk. As I write, Ambrose is frantically picking at every corner and every crevice of the room to find a switch or some sort of escape door. I simply sit and wait and write. Somehow I feel now that there was a reason Ambrose and I found this room, whereas the others, even that bastard Benson, hadn't. What purpose and to what end? Well, only time may tell now. Date Unknown The passage of time has become increasingly meaningless. Time was only a relative factor before, but here, in this impossible room, Hours pass by in what feels like an eternity as well as an instant. I say this to say that it is impossible for me to tell just how long Ambrose and I have been in this room. I know that it's been long enough for the two of us to start suffering of hunger pain. However long though, it's still not been enough time to discover and read every pictorial carving within the walls. At one point, I noticed that from the upper edge of the obelisk's peak, a large portion appeared to be missing. What should be there I cannot say, for as long as I've spent studying these runes, I cannot deduce any sort of real meaning from them. Even should I have known their translation though, I never had been able to see the carvings inscribed that far up on the obelisk. The ones I've been able to see, however, are stranger than any hieroglyphs or cave drawings I'd ever seen before. Many of them, particularly inscribed upon the obelisk itself, depicted a strange sort of symbol, one with a circular ring that diverted downward and formed four long points, perhaps a sort of humanoid figure, surrounded by an aura, lording over more traditional-looking stick figures that wielded what I can only assume to be a weapon of some sort. Admittedly, these I've relatively inferred to be depictions of the genocidal visions from earlier, the symbol, though humanoid in nature, differs from the stick figures, must obviously represent that horrible pharaoh, or that's what I had first thought. Then I examined further up the shaft of the obelisk to find that this same symbol was depicted in what I inferred to be outer space. In these scenes, I found that the being was shown to be escorted by a handful of these strange star-shaped glyphs. Looking around the room, I found there were indeed more scenes depicting these beings. In other scenes with the humanoid glyph, I watched it command the skies while men below slew each other senselessly. A few of the glyphs I noticed had the outline of a robe, clearly reminiscent of the robed figures I saw in the vision, 
carrying away the feral child. These figures I saw were drawn in the act of using various methods of bondage and torture upon unfortunate captives, of which one scene depicts a single one to survive the ordeal, to be then taken into their fold. It is within these carvings in particular that I found the carving of a large castle or tower, one which reflects more of a crude medieval fortress than anything, buried beneath a large mountain of sorts. What mountain it could possibly be, if even a real place here on this earth, I cannot even begin to infer. Nor can I infer as to why such a thing has gone unnoticed for all this time. Stranger still, though, were the scenes in which the stick figures were shown half-risen from the ground, as if they themselves were sprouting from the ground the way a plant would. In these, the ground itself appeared as wavy and malleable in a way, gelatinous almost. A sense of familiarity came to me with this. The way in which the ground appeared to ripple like water reminded me of the way in which I watched the soil around all across the earth transform from sand to live in sinew. Could this then be that very same depiction? Could this crude carving be telling of that vision, that the earth itself was composed of living flesh? That we as humans are merely the products of this ecological anomaly? This very thought has given me vertigo ever since it entered my head. As I write, Ambrose is sleeping, though I suspect his rest is anything but peaceful. I can hear him moaning incoherently in his sleep. Faintly, I can hear him muttering something as well, though I can't tell exactly what. I have a horrible feeling it's something to do with this room, though. Something with this place as a whole. Be this the case or not, I pray now only for the exit to be revealed so we can get out of this horrid place. At this point, I'm almost willing to say to hell with any of the rest of the expedition. Let them rot in here for as much as I could care. I just have to get out. Date unknown. Out of sheer exhaustion of my own, I'd fallen asleep as well. When I did... The first thing to accost me was that dreadful chanting again. The slow chorus that slowly built in pitch more and more. Adreyak Aduai Jubilex Adreyak Aduai Jubilex Adreyak Aduai Jubilex Behind these I could also hear sounds of growling. Slowly, the vision began to form. It was the Earth. I was seeing the Earth from space. No, it wasn't merely a vision of the Earth. It was of its birth. I saw the Earth being formed, molded as putty into its familiar shape. As this happened, I saw the Earth and its mass wiggle and writhe to form the ocean and the continents. Once this was completed, I was blinded by a supernatural light. So bright it was that looking directly into it threatened to strip me permanently of my abilities of sight. I could actually feel the light searing the flesh from my bones. From the light, I could hear these words uttered in a voice that was somehow far more commanding, far more terrifying than even the Pharaoh's was before. From my image... This world was born for millennia and more. This image has made the world thrive. For millennia, flesh has been corrupted because of you. What is it talking about, I wondered, while the light continued to burn brighter and brighter. I wondered too, exactly who or rather what was speaking as I was certain this was not the voice of any person. Suddenly, something inside myself came out. It was almost like a dormant instinct, one that I couldn't possibly describe other than to say that it wasn't myself that spoke, but rather something else threw me. Whatever it was, being or instinct, it spoke in a raspy, snake-like voice. I'll have come to make it all 
in. When I spoke, I was seemingly brought out of my body. My senses and the actions of my body weren't my own. The only faculties I still possessed control of were those of my thoughts. For this, my energy was spent trying to rack my mind around what it even was that I was witnessing. Why? and who it was that spoke to me and what his words meant. I was a fish in a bowl, a bird in a cage, forced to stay in confinement while forces far beyond my comprehension seemed to do with me as they damn well pleased. From my mouth, the snake-like voice spoke again. You have lied to yourself. We all have lied to ourselves. There is no peace, no prosperity. This star will have us. To this, the thundering voice bellowed, You're the only one that draws it to us. You are why our people were damned. You. I am the one that's saving us all. Through rebirth, I cleanse this world of corruption like you. I heard the other hiss condescendingly. Rebirth will not save you. I saw the truth when I was known. From this, I watched the aura of light dissipate to reveal the vomitile-looking being within. Tall, slender, and grotesque it was, without sexual organs, without skin, and most horrifyingly, without a face. All across its body, the being had no flesh to cover a single inch of the at least seven to eight feet of muscle tissue and sinew that made up its form. Its head, however, was a completely different story altogether with it being made entirely out of scraps of flesh that constantly writhed and pulsed in a rhythm similar to a heartbeat. I had absolutely no control over my body, else I likely would have screamed and run faster than I ever had in my life. The naked being stretched its gangly naked arm out towards me. My body retracted away, though not of my own command. From my mouth, the snake voice hissed, you cannot be rid of me. The time comes for all things to end. Flesh will live on, roared the being. This time I could swear there was an air of desperation in its words, a sense perhaps of fear. No. Flesh must end, just as the rest. Following these words, a shadow formed behind the horrid being. Gargantuan and wiggling, the shadowed mass appeared behind the figure, revealing a large violet glowing maw in its center that blinded me worse than the horrific being's aura had before. The being's misshapen head pulsed more and more vigorously at this. The star will come, just as it did long ago. I can feel it. It heard my call. The shadow drew closer and closer to the being. 
The glow from its center burned brighter, hotter, the closer it came. I watched then as everything around it was drawn into it, sucked in and devoured, ceasing to exist. The being's head pounded viciously now, to a degree that I was sure it would explode. You know it's true. The voice hissed again. It was then that I sensed an air of satisfaction in the tone, a sense of triumph in the revelation, as if it were proud to be telling this being that the earth was facing imminent doom at the whim of whatever this monstrosity was. This star, as he kept referring to it as. You feel it too. I can see your fear. I have no fear, roared the being defiantly. The world will live through rebirth, through my image, the image of flesh. All will thrive through rebirth. No, everything must end. Flesh, life. Reality, it all must end. Rebirth is only a lie. At this, the colossal shadow proceeded to devour the earth and everything around it. In an instant, I watched the entirety of the cosmos be consumed greedily whole, never to be seen again. The star will have us all. And there's no saving you. The voice ended this with a devious, raspy sort of chuckle before everything faded completely. That was when I awoke again, sweating and panting profusely. For a good 10 to 15 minutes, I sat, throwing my head wildly around the room. Once I was sure that I was both alive and fully conscious, both of body and mind, I looked up once more at the obelisk. A further way up, closer to the peak, I spotted a new icon, one that took the shape of an eight-sided sort of star, with a large dot or hole directly in its center. In some of these, I saw shapes depicted as descending from it. The other five-sided star shapes I saw before with the humanoid icon. In other carvings, particularly the ones closest to the peak of the obelisk, I saw scenes evidently depicting this eight-sided shape to travel the stars. Everywhere it went, I saw that everything appeared to be swallowed whole. Just as I'd seen in my dream, if it were merely a dream... I'm honestly not sure anymore. Seeing this, I cannot help but wonder not only who or what that was that spoke through me as a conduit, not only who or what the grotesque being was I saw before, but above all else, what was this gargantuan terror that had these beings terrified to death? Questions like these are the sort that'd make any man, even some of the most hardened of soldiers back in Vietnam, shake in bed at night trying to wrap their heads around it. They were the sort that'd make even the most educated professors realize just how little they know of life itself, how little they could ever know of life itself, and because of this, men as such would lose their minds completely. So much that is being shown to me, so much that was formerly unknown, now being pushed into the light, and yet to still be left with so little, to no answers at all. Yet this is madness itself, and I fear I will be no exception to its crippling hold. November 18th, 1964 I stand corrected in my last statement, grievously so. Madness, after what's happened, would have been a welcome boon. It started when I was awakened once again, having apparently fallen asleep, 
or at least somehow lost consciousness of myself, to find the searing pain shooting through my arm. My eyes snapped open to find Ambrose gnawing viciously on my right arm. I could hear him growling the way a dog would when gorging itself. When I tried to throw him away from me, he sent a clawed swipe across my left eye, drawing blood across the brow. I tried calling out to him to bring him back to his senses, but it was of no use. Whatever spell he was under, it was no mere madness or psychosis. Somehow I knew this wasn't just a desperate attempt at quelling his hunger after being trapped in this room for so long. His eyes were black, soulless and oozing black ichor, and I could see areas of his skin that he had evidently picked from his own body. Staring back at me, I heard him utter that haunting growl. Hadraok, Aduai, Jubilex Zantes Malios. It almost seemed to force itself out of his throat, as though he were being forced to say it. Paralyzed with shock, I was caught off guard yet again when Ambrose seized me tightly around my throat and with strength that shouldn't have been possible for someone as small as him, hurled me like a baseball straight into the obelisk. Before I could do so much as catch my breath, Ambrose lunged for me, pinning me against the obelisk before attempting to gnash at my face. The black ooze was gushing more and more from his eyes, semen I noticed to cause him pain. It was everything I could do to keep his ravenous jaws from tearing away my face like paper. He was relentless, managing to still tear a sizable chunk from my left cheek. I managed to hurl him away, sure enough, but that ended up costing me the last of my strength, being too weary from pain and sheer exhaustion from inability to sleep. I stood, cradling my wounds against the obelisk, as Ambrose rose up and prepared to pounce again, when suddenly, something stopped him. He stood paused mid-lunge, his face frozen in what appeared to be utter shock, despite his oozing eyes. I stared at him for a moment, confused as to why he wouldn't attack, when I noticed that he wasn't looking at me anymore but instead behind me toward the obelisk itself. His face was reflecting something, a bright light that made his already pale skin appear even lighter in color. When I turned then to look, I was immediately blinded by a light that seemed to burn even through my eyelids. It was as though the sun itself had exploded and that I'd just attempted to look upon the supernova with the naked eye. It was a far more advanced feeling of the effect a total eclipse would have after attempting to look at it with the naked eye. This was more than just a light, though. This was something sentient, something celestial, something alive. Even Ambrose, in spite of his possession, could see this, too, and was terrified of it. My eyes were searing inside my skull, slowly melting to slag. At any moment, I was afraid the rest of me would soon follow. Then from the direction of the light, I heard the baritone voice I knew all too well. The inhuman boom of that tyrannical pharaoh. Away from him. The voice bellowed. Its tones echoed all throughout the space of the domed room. Slowly I began to open my eyes once more. Once more my eyes were strained in doing this though I eventually succeeded in opening them all the way. My vision was blurred heavily, everything appearing to me as only a white, cloudy void with the vague outline of a person clad in a snow-white robe standing directly ahead of me in place of the obelisk. Distorted though my vision was, I noticed faintly that the being's limbs appeared to sway like branches in a strong wind and back and forth. I opened my mouth, but found myself unable to speak. I felt as though my throat had been muted, or that my voice had somehow been ripped from it. My mind was a firestorm of awe, fright, wonder, confusion, and more. So many thoughts, so many questions, so many feelings all at once invaded my mind, not allowing me a second to so much as breathe. 
Who or what was this thing? Where had it come from? The room? But then why had neither myself nor Ambrose seen it before? What was its purpose for being here now, saving my life like it had? Flesh must not continue. The end approaches, and there will be no hiding from it. As you have deceived yourself in doing for so long now, flesh child. I noticed when he, it, spoke that it was a sort of combination of the skinless humanoid's bestial growling and the hissing tone I heard before. I looked behind me toward Ambrose, either because of the force controlling him or because of something else entirely. He seemed unaffected by the heavenly light around the three of us. He stared forward and both terror and a sense of revulsion passed me toward the figure. You didn't believe you would prosper for the rest of time, did you? You weren't foolish to think that resetting this world would hide it from the gluttonous star. From chaos, did you? I watched Ambrose's mouth open, and from him the humanoid entity's own baritone voice bellowed. Flesh can live on. It will live on. You are our damnation. Just as you were then, so you are here and now. Looking back to the figure in white, I saw its arms raise, flailing jointless. I am not damnation, fleshling. I am truth. I am inevitability. Unlike my brethren, those you so cruelly slew, I am not here as an oracle. No, I am here as your harbinger of the end. I exchanged glances back and forth between Ambrose and the figure. Ambrose, I saw, began to clutch his temples and crumple to his knees, suffering some sort of migraine or pressure. <sighs> no! I heard Ambrose shout. No, I won't allow this. Flesh will continue. The flesh will live on through rebirth as it always has. Ambrose was in a fetal position on the ground now, clutching his temples now in nothing short of pure agony. What was going on with him, I could scarcely even guess. The figure replied, and when Chaos finds you again, as I know he will, what will you do then? Rebirth will conceal you, but for only so long. You destroy and rebuild this pathetic, meaningless empire, this world, and you believe it will save you? You name me as damnation, yet I... I'm only doing what is already predestined. Do you see? The figure began gliding forward, floating just above the ground as he did so. Out of reflex, I began moving backwards. Among all the spastic thoughts racing through my mind, the question then of what the figure might do to me once it reached me had my focus. In only 30 seconds, at least ten or more possibilities inferring what godlike power this being had at its command flashed across my mind at once. I kept backpedaling until I inevitably came upon and tripped over Ambrose's writhing body. When I looked again, the figure had reached me, looming over the bodies of me and Ambrose on the ground. I tried to move away again, only to find myself against the wall. There was nowhere to run. I was done for. I closed my eyes then and began sputtering my last prayer hysterically. I stopped and opened my eyes, however, when I heard screaming of sheer agony coming from in front of me. I saw that the figure was leaning over the body of Ambrose, him having been its apparent target instead of me. The figure I saw had one tendril, yes, tendril, not a hand, around Ambrose's throat and was glowing brighter and brighter. 
I could see the tendrils searing the skin of Ambrose's throat, causing him to cry out that much louder. His screams weren't a man's screams, though, leastways not of any one single man. Rather, they were the screams of every living being on Earth, all at once from the throat of Lionel Ambrose. Still holding him down, the figure proclaimed, Yes, you see it now, flesh child. You see the folly in what you do. That is why I'm here, to put an end to all misery once and for all, exterminating flesh and spirit. In another instant, the figure burst into a ball of white light, and following another wail of pain from Ambrose, I heard it declare, Uralga, Ilik Adrak Ka, Chaos Ralik Gaon. Then the light dissipated and the figure was gone. It was instantaneous, and at first I had no idea where I was or if I had not perished in that burst of light. In another five seconds, however, I found that the room had returned to the way it had been before. Ambrose laid motionless on the floor in front of me. I turned his body over to find his eyes rolled back and glazed over. Pressing against his throat with my fingers, I found he had no pulse. Whatever had happened, whatever the figure, the white, faceless pharaoh had done to him, Lionel Ambrose was dead now. My attention was jerked away, however, when I heard the sound of stones shifting again. When I turned, I saw the obelisk was sinking, the ceiling following close behind it. Immediately, I was throwing my head around in a panic to find an exit of some sort. Everywhere I looked, though, I saw only the inscribed walls around me. I rushed to the nearest wall and began frantically prying at every divide in between the stones, praying one of them could be pried apart and that I'd find it in time. It only took me another 15 seconds of this to realize I wasn't going to make it out doing that. There was no escape. I'd avoided the death Ambrose received at the white pharaoh's hand, only to meet it at the hands of the obelisk itself. This was the price I would pay for the pursuit of knowledge, to witness a horrifying portent, and then to be buried with it forever, never to tell any others of it. I'd failed, not only as a journalist, not only to the world as the chronicler of the events that transpired in this godforsaken tomb, but to my purpose at coming in the first place, to tell the greatest story I'd ever know. To honor my fallen friend, Private Elroy. Then, amid the pandemonium, I faintly heard stones shifting again, coming from the walls. Looking to my right, I found that a section of the wall was rising, revealing an exit to the room. Summoning every reserve of strength, I gunned it through the new doorway and into another dark corridor. There, I found that it too was shaken, with the ceiling lowering there and throughout as well. The tomb was collapsing, and I knew that it wouldn't be long before it would serve as the eternal resting place for any who were still inside when it did. Through the long, dark corridor I ran, I had no idea where I was going, and there was no way to know. A few times I'd slammed into a wall that I couldn't see, all around me, with each passing second, the walls and ceiling shook. The closer to the ground the ceiling came, the harder it soon became to even breathe. Still, I kept running. I wouldn't stop. I couldn't. Until either I made it out, or death took me. About three quarters through the latest corridor I'd found myself running through, I began to hear voices at my right, likewise clamoring in a panic like mice for the exit. For just the briefest of moments, I swore I could hear one of the distant voices cry out that they had found the entrance of the tunnel. Realizing there was still a chance to make it out alive, to tell this story and fulfill my promise, I turned and broke for the direction of the voices. Despite how much closer and closer they appeared, the further I went along, 
That last corridor stretched seemingly for an eternity. I was quickly running out of breath, out of strength, but I didn't stop. Finally, like I was looking through the abysmal tunnel of death itself and peering toward heaven, I saw the light at the far end. I could make it, and eventually I did. In my hysteria when I found myself out of the tunnel, I was set to continue running, probably even to the ends of the earth, but was stopped by one of the men waiting on the outside in the campsite. It took another 10 seconds before they were able to get me to calm down and regain my composure. When I finally did, seeing that I was safe, that I had made it, and would live to tell the story after all, the only reaction I knew to have at that instant was to devolve into a sobbing, inconsolable mess. It was over. All over. I was alive, and now I had a story. When I could finally come back to myself fully, I took one last look toward the pyramid. It was gone, swallowed into the earth forever, or perhaps until the day comes that that nameless and horrifying white pharaoh chooses to re-emerge to preach once again of the end of days, as he had so long ago. To this day, I still wonder what he meant. I wonder of the things too, such as whatever happened to poor Travis Buckner, or even to that rat bastard Benson. As for the ones that did make it out, of which only two of them were the Trinexus advisors, we were all exhausted and quite speechless from fright. Some from the handful of expedition crew survivors were even gibbering deliriously, some even devolving into howls of mad hysterical laughter. I couldn't blame them. I can't blame them either for their fate afterwards, being confined to a mental institution. As I said, especially in writing this now, even long after, I wish now in a way that I could have been institutionalized with them. I wish that I could simply doubt my sanity during any of this and say that it never happened. Such is the paradox then. Before departing from the site, I requested that there be one last photo taken of those that survived that fateful and harrowing experience. As damning as the memory is, the thought that I lived miraculously for over two weeks without food or water and through an unexplainable phenomena as what I had without fulfilling my promise to tell this story weighed far heavier on my soul. As I found out, I would make the right call in doing this. When I returned to the base in Saigon a few days ago, I planned to record this final part of this journey and send it for publication. Just yesterday morning, however, I received a brief letter from the Trinexus Corps, forbidding me from publishing or publicly speaking of any of the details I was aware of from the past month and that disobedience would result in criminal prosecution. I couldn't believe it. After everything I was forced to endure on their behalf, and after everyone else that lost their lives, they were now enforcing my silence. As much as I want to forget about this, I know I owe it to them and to Private Elroy to keep this chronicle, perhaps the only surviving record of their lives and of the haunting truth with the act of discovery. They will not be forgotten, even if only memorialized by these pages, never to see the public eye. To the men and women in the photo that day, November 11th, 1964, the day we narrowly escaped the hands of fate at the hands of that terrible white pharaoh's tomb, and to those that tragically never made it out, I say that, even if your country and the world has forgotten you, I haven't. I may not be able to tell your stories in my lifetime, but I know as certain as I am that what happened in that tomb was real, that one day, someone will find these pages and will speak its story to the world. That is my cross to bear, to preserve the memory, both the honorable and the horrifying. Because of this, despite the still persistent, the only occasional night terrors I face, I can still find semblances of comfort. Because of this, I will still smile. 
the day of truth will come, I promise. That was the last entry of Papa Dan's memoir. After that, up until the day he passed, he held on to this journal and its haunting tale. No matter how much it killed him to do so, he stuck to his word to communicate the events in Egypt. I've read this many, many times now since the day I found it in their old house. For the longest time, I had no idea of what to even make of it. My grandfather, granted, was never once in his career as a journalist reputed to be a slanderer or liar when it came to writing any columns, for and outside of the army. Still, for so long I wasn't sure I could accept this as true. That is, not without some sort of concrete proof. I wanted to a degree at least to believe my grandfather. I wanted to believe that what he wrote in his memoir was real and that my grandfather really was a hero, being the sole keeper of the memories of so many others. So I began looking for the truth. For at least the past ten years since Papa Dan passed away, I scoured across libraries, the internet, and even tried looking for old news articles to try and find anything. Anything from mid-November 1964 relating either to him, the Pyramid, or any of the other survivors. The only result from that, though, turned out to be a single article that more or less was summed up to say, Expedition crew mysteriously goes insane after stint in outskirts of Egypt. The article made neither mention of him or any of the others. The photo listed, however, surprisingly enough, was the same one Papa Dan had taken the day they left Egypt. Because of this, I knew something really had happened there in mid-November of 1964. It wasn't for another four years or so that I ended up finding out exactly what. Never giving up the pursuit to prove my grandfather's story to be true, I spent the next four years looking into and studying each Middle Eastern religious text I could find to see if there'd be anything relating to the white pharaoh, the pyramid itself, or any of the other beings spoken of in the memoir, while also saving money to book a flight to Egypt myself and see the site for myself. For the longest time, until I finally managed to accrue the necessary funds, I was at a loss, being unable to find any sort of text relating to the aforementioned aspects in any known culture. It seemed then that the only way to prove his story was true was to ask the people of Egypt, judging from how afraid they were reported to be in Papa Dan's accounts. Finally, in the summer of 2018, I scrambled the money together and flew to Egypt to see the expedition site for myself. Like with my grandfather, I spent the first week in a small hotel that was both cheap and available while scouting the land. During this time, I tried asking a few of the locals what they knew of the white pharaoh of the desert pyramid, or of the obelisk itself. Most of them either looked at me confused or just kept walking, ignoring me. Some, though, older folks gave me the same grim, horrified expression Papa Dan described he had gotten when he asked. Just like with what he was told back then, I too was told that only infidels, fools, and traitors dared seek what I was after. Finally, I set for the site itself where my grandfather had narrowly escaped death all those years ago. This took another week, and when I did arrive, I was confused at first. There were no pyramids to speak of, at least not the one Papa Dan wrote of. It was when I came right on the spot that those few that had actually known of the pyramid had told me it'd be that I found it. Despite being buried under 56 or more years of sand, I saw what appeared to be a large slab of stone. Further investigation revealed the stone to be not of the pyramid itself, but a fragmented piece of that room. With the slab of stone bearing the eight-sided star hieroglyph Papa Dan described seeing upon the obelisk, the colossal terror that, according to his memoir, was capable of both the creation and other devastation of all existence. The very thing that supposedly had been answering the white pharaoh's call. The most horrific aspect of all this, however, was that cradling the slab there buried in the sand was the skeleton of a man wearing the tattered remnants of the black polo tri-nexus uniform shirt. 
On the pocket, though faded and worn, I faintly read the name, R. Benson, across the tag. It was true, all of it. The pyramid, the portents, the obelisk, all of it. It was real, and now I'd found it. Clutched by the bones of the very man that bestowed this journey, this curse upon him in the first place. How he managed to make it out, I don't know, and neither did Papa Dan or anyone else for that matter. But all the same he did, commemorating his own memory of the expedition. Of the day in which he and so many others paid the ultimate price for pursuing long-forgotten secrets. I suppose, though, I still have to commend him because without him there would have been no proof to corroborate my grandfather's greatest story, his most fantastic, most horrifying, and all-too-real account, The Obelisk. I say this now, if you can hear me, Papa Dan. Wherever you are now, this is for you. This is your day, the day you toiled so hard to make happen and for so long couldn't. This is the day of memory for you and for all the others, both that survived and those that didn't. For you, Papa Dan. Put the knife down. Ted tried to stay calm in situations where most people would panic. Ava held a knife to his throat, and his world collapsed. But he couldn't show his emotion. Not now. Not with the blade pressed against his jugular. The girl had just turned 16, and after five days in a new school in a new town, Ted thought the change was too much. His new job was at the high school of Ravensfield, an all-but-dead town in the middle of nothing. Miles around their new house were farms, crops, and horses that were too hot and bothered to do much of anything. Even so, Ava had seemed excited to start a new adventure, compiling lists of things to talk about with her new teachers and strategies to make new friends. Having same-sex parents was a go-to these days, so the internet had said, even if one of them was dead. It wasn't taboo anymore, and so, at the top of her list was my dad's. But after the first day, she'd rushed through the front door and stomped to her room, bypassing Ted's anxious smiles. It was the first time since she'd been told she was adopted and that neither father was her biological relative that Ava had seemed so distant. Even then, it had only lasted a few hours. Now, day five, and she had a knife to his throat. To keep him from doing anything stupid, she'd said. He was on the floor, his daughter kneeling over him, animal eyes prowling around the room like she expected company. A gold chain dangled from her neck, swinging above Ted's eyes. He didn't recognize it. Ted put his hands up, palms out in defeat, and repeated his earlier plea. Put the knife down, honey. His voice was quiet. Drops of sweat pooled around his hairline, and he knew she could see it. Her eyes flicked to his trembling hands, and she shook her head in defiance. Don't make me go back there, Ava said, teeth gritted. I won't go back to that school. Ted knew something was wrong at school, but Ava wouldn't talk about it. None of the kids would. Just mumbled about the raven. What happened? Ted asked. Is this about the missing kids? Ava's face flashed with sadness and fear. Her grip on the knife loosened, and she looked at the blood, looked down at her father. Oh, Daddy! She cried. What have I done? Ted took the opportunity and pulled himself from Ava's grasp. He grabbed the knife and tossed it across the living room. It clanged against the tiled floor as he wrapped Ava in his arms. Talk to me, sweetie, Ted managed through a gush of tears. It's the raven, Ava cried into Ted's chest. It's evil. 
With Ava sedated on sleeping pills, Ted felt okay about leaving her alone. The school principal had been open to an after-hours meeting that same day, and Ted was still counting his lucky stars when he pulled up to the parking lot at 7 p.m. Heading to the principal's office, he felt eyes on the back of his neck and was conscious that the shadows were morphing into strange shapes. Something was happening at the school that had terrified his daughter, and he intended to find out what. He hoped the principal would have some answers. Dr. Cutter? His hand was poised at the door when the voice broke. Ted pushed through the door and smiled. Please, just call me Ted. Principal Wernos shook his hand. They'd met last month over a digital interview and again a few days earlier when he started as the school counselor. Call me Laura. Ted took a seat in the office. A small tabletop lamp provided dim light for the meeting. A ceiling fan blew warm air around the room. My daughter, Ava, he said, lifting one knee over the other, has raised some concerns about this raven of yours. With those kids going missing recently, I had to say something. Laura squirmed at the mention of the mascot and held back a frown. The edges of her lips betrayed her, but Ted suspected the untrained eye would have missed it. His training was second nature now. Is Ava okay? Laura swallowed. She watched Ted for a few moments as he recounted the attack earlier that evening. She seemed to be sizing him up. Her eyes moved between him and the door, which had been left ajar. She leaned across the desk, their eyes now fixed on each other, and took a long, slow breath. Ted... I'm sorry, she whispered. Something strange is going on in this school. Her eyes shifted to the door again. It's the kids. Waiting for more, Ted found himself on the edge of his seat. Laura opened her mouth to continue, tucked her auburn hair behind her ears, and flashed a look at the door again, like she was waiting for someone to come in. What did Ava tell you? Before he could speak, the lamp flickered and went out. The whoosh of the fan stopped, and they both looked to the ceiling. Laura gulped as the two sat in silence in the dying light. The door swung shut behind them, and Laura jumped, a hand to her heart. She went to the door, peered through the glass pane with her name on it, and turned back to Ted. Her eyes wide, she slid down the door and put a finger to her lips. Get down, she hissed. A shadow appeared behind the door, and Ted dove under Laura's desk, his own heart pounding. The figure stopped by the door, raised a hand to the glass, and scratched at Laura's nameplate. Ted watched the shadow as it moved along the hallway outside, Laura's eyes blazing into him begging him to signal it was safe. He nodded. She moved to her knees, gripped the windowsill, and peered through. Though he didn't know for what, Ted waited and held his breath until Laura exhaled. Did you see it? She asked him. Ted shook his head. Laura moved back around her desk, pulled open a drawer, and lifted out a gun. Her eyes glided over the silver weapon as it shone through the bleak light. What the hell is that for? Ted stepped back. I'm going to level with you. Laura held the gun firmly by her side and put a hand palm down on the desk. There's something wrong with our mascot. At first, I thought, with the missing kids, but it's something else. Ted stared at her unsure what to make of this. I'm calling the police. He reached for his phone, but the screen was dark. He tapped it. Dead. Like the lamp and the fan. He raised his eyes to Laura, who didn't look surprised. It started about three months ago, over break. You know the girls have been going missing. Laura didn't blink, 
the words coming from her like she'd had this conversation a hundred times before. But the boys, they're getting violent. And I think it's got something to do with Daryl, our mascot. The raven stalked the hallways, dripping muck and blood with each step. Its feathers melted to its body, still forming. The change was almost complete. Clawed feet tapped at the linoleum flooring as it walked back to its hideout. The girl was inside, waiting, sobbing, begging to a god that wasn't watching, a god that didn't care, a god that gave up on the town of Ravensfield. Its beak, razor sharp, pushed the door open with a creak, alerting the child chained in the basement that it was feeding time. The crying and moaning excited the bird. It stepped down the concrete stairs, wings dragging along the walls, leaving a trail of muck to drip to the floor. I want my mommy, the girl begged. The raven tilted its head hollow eyes staring at the tender flesh, and lunged toward her. Ava awoke in a cold sweat, sucking air into her lungs with greedy deep breaths and sharp exhales. She was nauseous, and her stomach ached. Hair matted to her face, sweat like glue. She tried to push the nightmare from her brain. The raven, tearing skin from bone the child, screaming in the dark. Another one. Wiping strands of wet hair from her eyes and mouth, Ava sat up in bed, trembling, head throbbing. Her entire body was slick with sweat, skin crawling with goosebumps. The pain in her stomach came again, and she breathed through it, clutched at the gold chain around her neck. Dim light flowed into her room between cracks in the shutters. Remnants of the dream, or was it a memory, clung to the inside of her eyelids, and she shook the imagery away. The raven's blood-soaked beak pulling at veins and tearing through the muscle. The violent impulses were bubbling under the surface, even now, but they were outweighed by the shame she felt. With a gasp, she remembered what she'd done that afternoon. Her dad was a beautiful man. She loved him more than anything. The raven could not take that away from her. He'd said he was going to see the principal tonight. Ava lifted the bedsheets and twisted to the side, knowing she had to get to the school. But her stomach lurched, her vision swirling into nothing but static. The impulses started again. They started in her stomach as though her life force was turning on her. The rage that led her to hold a knife to her father's throat. Her veins filled with hatred, and sharp pain ran up the back of her neck. She tried to fight, to remember love and happiness, but the pain pulsated through her body. All that remained was despair. Hatred. A deep cold washed over her. Everything inside her wanted to stab someone's eyes out. An offering for the raven. Her throat tightened, her chest convulsed, and Ava opened her mouth to vomit. She tilted her head to the side and let the liquid soak into the sheets and the mattress. The static in her eyes cleared, just a little and she saw the vomit was black. Muck. And that's when she remembered what happened on her first day of school, remembering the janitor. Choking back a scream, Ava lay in the vomit, the stench somehow familiar, and fell back to sleep. The impulse to kill thumped in her stomach. Nobody knew much about Daryl. Laura recounted his interview a few months earlier and how the requisite police checks turned out nothing. But as far as his personal life, she drew a blank. All she had were vague, contradictory details. 
like how he'd said he was from the South during the interview, but in subsequent conversations, had shrugged and told her he moved around a lot. All she knew for sure, she told Ted, was that he worked in an old bookstore before applying for a janitorial position at the school. The school mascot gig came later, a bonus payment to help make ends meet. That was when the kids started disappearing. Laura had her suspicions from the start, but they were no more than a gut feeling. As they tiptoed down the hallways toward the exit, hissing back and forth about Daryl, Ted heard a sharp sound behind him. He spun around. The raven. Arms lined with large feathers, as though transforming into wings. But the creature still had the hands of a man. A human neck, but black. Hollow raven's eyes and a razor-sharp beak, like a knife, ready to cut into the flesh. Its chest was puffed out like a bird, with the school logo front and center, and its legs bent backward at the knees, thinning out to clawed feet. It was wet with some kind of muck dripping from the suit. In the fading daylight, Ted thought he saw real feathers underneath the slick surface, as though it wasn't a suit at all. The raven stepped toward them. Laura fumbled with her gun as the clawed feet scraped against the floor. Stay away, Laura begged. Her voice cracked, but her arm was steady, outstretched with the gun aimed at the raven. Ted looked closer. The muck was mixed with blood, spots of red glistening. The drops were heavy, splatting to the ground with a wet squish. I don't think that's Daryl, Ted muttered and turned to flee. The raven rushed toward them, wings outstretched, and sent a soulless cry through the hallways. Laura pulled the trigger, the bullet sinking into the raven's chest. It didn't flinch. She tried again. Come on! Ted pulled on her arm. The third bullet missed, and Laura followed Ted toward the school's front entrance. It was chained, and as Ted pushed hard against the doors, he saw heavy rain careening toward the earth, lightning stirring in the clouds. Laura was down around the corner, high heels clicking into the distance, and Ted ran to follow. The raven snatched at his shirt from behind, and Ted felt the muck on his neck. It burned a little, and he fought to pick up the pace, but it was too late. The raven's hands were on him, pulling him to the ground. His face smacked against the floor, his head ringing from the force, and the raven jumped onto his back. A gunshot tore through the hallway, and the raven, poised to tear into Ted's neck, stopped. Three months earlier. He'd never been serious about the occult or demons or whatever. It was just a hobby. A while back, he'd been so deep in a search engine rabbit hole looking through books on the occult for the store. That's when he saw it. Sometimes things spoke to him without words. He heard it loud and clear, felt it like a compulsion, like his whole body wanted him to hear the unspoken words. This had been one of those times. Hala. An old, leather-bound book with Slavic inscriptions. It was fate. It had to be. His father and his father's father were Slavic. He caressed the computer screen, feeling the static biting at his fingertip, and knew he had to have it. When it arrived, his hobby changed. He didn't know why or how, but the book told him to do things. To move to a town called Ravensfield. As much as he tried to ignore the demands, something inside him knew he'd like it knew he'd enjoy the taste. The first girl, Isabel, was an outcast like him. The book chose her. But it didn't feel right when she was down in his basement, 
tied up and screaming through the socks stuffed in her mouth. He wasn't a murderer. As he'd moved to untie the girl to apologize and beg for forgiveness, the book flipped open. The Ritual. Seven Sacrifices and a Vessel. Isabel would be the first, and despite his rational mind urging him against it, he lunged toward her and sunk his teeth into her neck. From the girl's blood, an object began to form, but it was soft and shapeless, like unformed clay. As he burped the last of the girl away, her organs absorbed into him, changed him. He knew what needed to be done. Six more, and the object would be complete. Then he'd find the vessel, but first he needed recruits, more like him, and he knew just where to go to get them. Heading for the stairs, back to the world of the living, the book whispered to him again. He looked at the mascot suit, the raven, and pulled it on. Yes, he thought as the bird head slipped over his human facade. This is what I am now. Laura stepped closer, flashing the gun and the dying light. Ted couldn't hear her words, but the sharpness in her tone was enough. The strength in her voice. The gunfire. The raven fell off of him, hissing toward the principal as it collided with the floor. Its clawed feet ripped at Ted's flesh, the pain searing through him, but he got to his feet in a daze of confusion, letting Laura pull him away from the mascot. In here! Laura pushed through a door, and the words, Staff Only, glimmered in the night. The door slammed behind them, Laura flicking a feeble lock, and they piled down a staircase into the basement. A light hung from the ceiling, and Ted pulled the cord. A dim yellow glow revealed an unmade bed in a dank corner of the room. Sheets sprawled in a mess, sweat and urine wafting from the fabric. Cleaning supplies and an open bottle of bleach by a shower that hadn't been maintained for some time. The stench of mold was almost too much, but the bleach cut through it, stinging Ted's eyes. Someone lived down here. Through the discomfort, he scanned the room, stopping at the brick wall painted in blood, still wet, dripping to the floor. A shrine of severed heads, tips of the spines jutting out, decorated the floor in a circle. A thick, leather-bound book sat open in the middle, the eyes of the raven's victims staring into the writing. Half-melted candles lined a homemade shelf, an inscription carved into the bricks. Further along, the wall was a blood portrait of a half-human, half-bird monster. Ted brought a hand to his heart and let out a shocked gasp as thunder and lightning rolled toward them from outside. A blue glow flashed through the basement from a small window, level with the ground outside. Laura vomited despite herself, holding a hand over her mouth to stop the flow, but it streamed through the gaps in her fingers. She stepped toward the wall and, breathing hard, choked out, What the fuck is this? Reaching to the book, Ted pulled at a fabric bookmark jutting out of the bottom of the pages. He flicked it open and scanned through it. The Alavidi? Thunder crashed just beyond the basement window, and rain pummeled at the fragile piece of glass. Ted repeated the words, and the thunder sounded closer, as though the storm had responded to the name. What is that? Laura asked, brow furrowed, wiping her hand on her trousers and looking out the window at the storm. A demon, Ted replied, his eyes fierce. Slave to the Hala, a child-eater. Despite how the raven appeared, 
Ted wasn't ready to believe in demons, despite what they'd seen. He was a man of science. Cannibalism could explain the missing kids, but not this. Not a demon preying on the town's youth. Nonetheless, he continued reading. It brings extreme changes to the weather. The rain, the dead crops, it's all the Alavidi. It can take many forms. The raven is just one of them. The Alavidi are men with characteristics of the more common female demon, the Hala. Alavidi don't usually eat children, but it's not unheard of. Ted scanned a few more pages in horror, devouring passages about the Alavidi recruiting male children to do its bidding. It described a cult, but didn't explain what was happening here. But Ted's subconscious mind was shouting at him, begging him to pay attention. He'd seen these pages, but hadn't noticed something. Flipping back, his eyes stopped on an image. A gold necklace. Those same inscriptions from the walls were carved into the surface. Ava. The thin chain held tight to her skin as Ava leaned over the edge of the mattress, heaving. It felt hot against her beating chest, even through her pajamas, stinging her skin. Instinct told her to hold the gold necklace to her heart while chunks of yesterday's dinner spewed to the ground. Breathing through another convulsion, Ava laid back, sweat oozing from her body. The pain in her stomach was sharp, like something was squirming inside of her. She lifted her pajama shirt and drew her eyes downward. Black veins stretched across her torso. Ava pressed a finger to her stomach and felt movement deep within her again. Despite the stench of vomit and sweat, she focused on the rain drumming against the window, clutched the necklace tight in both hands. She pleaded for her father to return, to take her away from this place, prayed into the gold necklace, terrified of what was happening inside of her body. Thunder clapped against the sky, and a figure appeared in the doorway. It's going to be okay, it said. Ava lifted her head as far as she could and squinted through the bleak room. The figure walked in. She didn't recognize the face, but the symbol on his jacket was all too familiar. A football jacket. The Ravensfield Claws. When she'd first heard that name, she'd giggled at the lack of imagination. But now, laying weak and helpless in her bedroom, the logo made her tremble. You're going to be okay, Ava. The voice drew closer. Others in the football team followed him into the bedroom, eyes boring into her with a look Ava couldn't identify. Another crash of thunder lit up the room for a moment. The team formed a circle and knelt around her bed. The first boy, team captain Jimmy Lowe, stood over her. The team began a low hum, which turned into a chant. Ava didn't recognize the language. What are you going to do to me? Ava asked, her voice hoarse. The necklace began to burn into her skin. Jimmy frowned. It isn't what we're going to do to you, he said. It's what you're going to do for us. She gripped her necklace again, the heat searing her hands, and wished harder than she had ever before that her dad would burst through the door. But she knew. Nobody was going to help her. Jimmy pressed a hand over the girl's mouth and held it there. Ava wept hard, almost watching herself from above as Jimmy and the claws lifted and carried her down the stairs. Then, out the front door and into the storm, toward the school. I have to get home. Ted's voice and body were shaking as he looked at the image of the necklace. How she'd gotten it was unknown, but the page's description was undeniable. 
The Alavidi, the raven, banging on the basement door, was collecting materials. The children's bones, blood, and organs for the arrival of the Hala. Seven sacrifices. Ted swallowed hard and focused on breathing, afraid to continue reading. The pages depicted the ritual in clear detail. The contents were unlike anything he could imagine. Specific ways to dismember the bodies. Certain sections of flesh could not be eaten and must remain untouched for the ritual to succeed until the vessel was chosen. From the remains of the children grew an artifact. The necklace was imbued with the demon's spirit and an ancient inscription. The artifact chose a vessel, a beating heart to feed on, to steal from. The Chosen One must consume the untainted flesh of the sacrifices to give life to the Hala. Ted ignored the banging on the basement door and focused on the text. He digested every word, his stomach turning with each description and knowing that the mascot had carried out each step to the letter. To his baby girl. He searched the text for any indication of what happened to the vessel once the ritual was complete. He found nothing and feared the worst. Ava has the necklace, Ted told Laura, her hands clasped around her mouth. She's the vessel. The banging stopped. Ted and Laura turned to the door. Laura lifted the gun, aimed it toward what they both knew was coming and waited. The bleak light swinging above them went out. The door burst open and the raven's inhuman leg crashed into the darkness. Something had happened to the mascot. It was less human than before, more transformed. The mascot's suit was just a shell, a skin that the creature was shedding. Chunks of the suit and the once human skin dwelling beneath dropped to the floor in clumps, and the raven stepped toward them. Laura fired, but in the darkness the bullet missed. Her hands shook too much. She couldn't focus. The raven approached, wings outstretched, beak wide. A row of sharp teeth grew from the beak and its jaw stretched wider than either Ted or Laura could have imagined. She fired her weapon again, but knew that it was useless. She squeezed her finger against the trigger once more, but Ted pulled at her arm. We have to get out of here! He dragged her toward the window as a bolt of lightning crashed outside. It was small. He didn't know if they'd be able to squeeze through, but there was no other option. The raven stalked toward Ted, a shrill cry reverberating through the basement. He torpedoed the book through the brittle glass and then lifted Laura. She cut her hands on shards as she pulled herself through the window. Laura crawled out the window, ignoring the pain in her arms and elbows, grabbed at the book, and ran into the storm. Ted jumped, clung to the windowsill, and pulled himself up. He called for Laura, but she was gone. The rain smacked against the concrete outside as Ted shimmied through the small hole. The raven gripped Ted's legs with both arms, the heat from the black muck melting through his pants. He cried in pain and begged for Laura to help, but knew she wouldn't come. As the raven pulled Ted back inside the dark basement, his fingernails scraped against the wet cement. He grabbed onto the sides of the broken window, slashing open his forearms and palms, and held on with all his might. The raven threw him back to the ground. He hit the floor hard, his upper body soaked from the rain, and he hid the glass shard behind his back as he sat up. The raven grinned through the darkness, its yellow teeth like a fluorescent light the hard beak curling up at the sides, an impossible sight that sent Ted's heart into his throat. What do you want? He screamed at the creature, gripping the shard. 
It was soaked in red now, slippery from the blood seeping through the slashes on his forearms. The raven didn't answer. It closed its wings around its body, covering the school logo on its chest, and walked toward him, tilted its head to one side. Its eyes, black and hollow, looked straight into him, searched him for something, and Ted felt its presence moving inside of him, prying into the depths of his soul. Closing its eyes, the raven began to recite a phrase. Ted didn't know the words, but he recalled seeing them in the book. A passage. What was it about? To see if he was worthy of being an Alavidi. He couldn't think with the raven searching him, seeking to know him. You might as well kill me, Ted said, struggling to stand. I will never be like you. The raven opened its eyes and lunged at Ted, dragging him back to the ground, teeth bared, beak pecking at his throat and neck. Shoving his weakening forearm under the raven's chin, pushing into its neck, he tried to fight it off. His other hand reached for the glass shard. It sliced his fingers as he gripped it and screamed into the raven's face, plunging the shard into the creature's eye. Black muck spewed from the eye like a geyser, pouring into Ted's own eyes and mouth, but he didn't stop. He stabbed again and again, slicing the raven's face open. The raven retreated, the shard deep inside its head, and fell to the ground. Lightning crashed again, and Ted saw the window. He leapt toward it, pulled himself through, and crawled like a newborn into the rain gushing from the heavens. His arms were weak. He'd lost so much blood. But he managed to stand and stumbled away from the basement, knowing only one thing for certain. He had to get home to Ava. Ava dreamed of drowning, wished the water spilling from the heavens would fill her lungs until she could no longer breathe, begged for a way out, for this to end. The claws carried her through the rain, reciting those same words repeatedly, drilling them into her brain. She was weak. The gold necklace sunk into her skin. It felt as though the object was attached to her heart, moving up and down in rhythm to the steady beat. Jimmy looked back at her every now and then and smiled. Even in her dazed state, she could tell it was more than confidence. It was a knowing look. He was waiting for something. Maybe for someone. They walked through the school parking lot, and the claws put her down on the front steps, banged on the door and waited. She knew who was coming. Her stomach ached at the memory of chewing down the flesh. The raven watched her, holding her mouth open and throwing in more. She'd coughed and choked, but Ava had done the unthinkable when the raven forced her mouth shut and held her nose. She'd eaten the remains of her classmates. But the memory was distant, a nightmare brought forth by an unknown force. She had woken in the middle of class, screaming, the other students laughing at her and filming the insanity for Instagram and TikTok. The sickness inside of her had begun to grow. The hatred, the rage until her father had asked one too many times what was wrong. He was here at the school, with the raven. It's all my fault. She knew that wasn't true, but it didn't matter. Something squirmed in her stomach, and the claws responded with an excited groan. Whatever was going to happen, it would be soon. Jimmy banged on the door again, impatient, he called out to someone, but his voice was silenced by a gunshot tearing through the storm. 
Ava tried to look and see what was happening, but couldn't. The football team surrounded her as though she were precious cargo. Get away from her, a female voice said, or the next shot won't miss. Ted staggered through the rain at the sound of gunfire, holding on to the school's brick walls as he went. His vision was fading. He knew he needed to bandage his wounds or he wouldn't see the morning. Turning a corner toward the front of the school, he saw the claws with their hands raised. Laura pointed her gun at them and cradled the book. Laura! Ted called. She ignored him and stepped toward the boys. Let her go! She repeated. Her voice was firm. They moved aside, each hesitant step smaller than the last. But through the gaps, Ted saw his daughter lying on the school's front steps. Ava! He limped to her, feet almost numb, and fell to her side. He ran his fingers over her hair and bent down to kiss her forehead. She gazed up at him, whispered, Daddy, and then shut her eyes. It's too late, one of the footballers said. Ted recognized him as the team captain and asked him what he meant. Jimmy shrugged and pointed behind them. Ted followed the boy's finger, held Ava tight as the raven appeared in the storm, half of its face disguised by black muck. Moving Ava into a sitting position and wrapping his arms around her, Ted screamed for the raven to leave them alone. Laura ran to their side, guns still threatening the teenagers, but they didn't seem bothered by the weapon anymore. The raven gave them power. Like I said, Jimmy repeated, it's too late. Look. He nodded toward Ava. Ted looked down at his daughter, black veins covering her body, and watched a lump forming in her stomach. He lifted her shirt to see and recognized the shape of a hand pushing out of the skin. Before he could react, the hand moved up toward Ava's chest. The girl groaned in pain and clutched at her necklace. She opened her mouth to scream, but the hand filled her throat, silencing her pain. Ava broke free from Ted's arms, fell to her hands and knees, and convulsed with the raven and the football team reciting those unknown words, louder and louder, over the thumping rain. Ted and Laura moved to see what was happening. The hand pulled itself from Ava's mouth, exposing an elbow. A face appeared inside Ava's throat, slick with black muck, and the exposed arm dragged itself across the concrete to pull the face free. A razor-sharp beak and hollow eyes, just like the raven. It was not the face of anything human. Hala, the claws murmured, raising their arms to the sky and screaming the demon's name. Hala, be thy queen! The raven stepped forward, pushing Ted and Laura aside, and knelt in front of Ava. It took the hand in its own, caressed the newborn face, and pulled hard. The creature sprung forth from Ava, who collapsed onto the ground, unconscious. The demon curled in the fetal position in the raven's arms, and Ted moved to his daughter's side. Holding his daughter, her body limp, Ted felt his own eyes grow heavy. Despite the rain, his arms were stained from his wounds, and he knew it was too late. There was no coming back from this. He turned to Laura and whispered, Get Ava out of here. But the woman's mouth was agape, her eyes red with tears, and she shook her head. The claws encircled them. Jimmy snatched the gun from Laura and tossed it away. As Ted fought to keep his eyes open, the newborn demon, the Hala, began to take shape. 
half human, half bird, a raven. Its empty eyes scanned the area, sized up the teenage boys, and looked back to the raven. A decision was made in a language shared only between them, and both sprung to life. The claws screamed in confusion as the demons tore their bodies apart, gulping down their flesh. Despite his best efforts, Ted fell back into darkness. Ava woke to silence. The raven and the holla stood over her, gentle feathers tracing her cheekbones and chin, taking her in, adoring her. She crawled backward on her hands, kicking out at the creatures before her until her hands hit something familiar. Looking down, she saw her dad, unmoving and covered in blood. Tears streamed from her face as she stared at her father's corpse. She looked away, tried to blink the reality into nothingness, and saw the claws. The principal. What was left of them, scattered around the school parking lot, half eaten. The necklace didn't burn anymore. It just sat atop her skin as a necklace ought to. But the inscriptions were different. She could read them. The bearer of this chain will bring forth Queen Hala. Ava eyed the principal's weapon, still clutched in her dead hands, and moved to reach for it. The raven and the Hala moved toward her. A glimmer appeared in their hollow eyes, a light she recognized from the way her father looked at her. Caring. But her fingers stopped short. She looked back at the Hala. Something inside her felt warm. The impulses shot through her neck again, but Ava didn't fight them. She liked it, embraced it, the way she'd embraced her father. She looked back at her dad. Dead. Both of them are dead. Her family. Family. The child eaters helped her up. As rage boiled through her blackened veins, they led her back to Ravensfield. To her home. To eat. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights 